Okay, everyone, we're now live on YouTube. Great, I'm just checking in and seeing that all my group members can see it. So uh, perhaps we should get started. So hi, thank you for everybody for coming here uh, and for the tremendous response that we've had for this uh, for this uh, sort of grand experiment in trying to do a, a intimate workshop in front of a lot of people. So, uh, so, uh, so we've had about 1400 uh, people that have signed up online. So hopefully this will be a really interesting and engaging uh, Experience. Greg Stevens will talk. My co-organizer will speak in a minute about all of the logistics and things about commenting and the, how the talks will be organized. But for starters, uh, I wanted to thank a couple of uh, groups and individuals for helping out. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Emory uh, Initiative in Theory and Modeling of Living Systems for providing uh, some financial and administrative support for getting all this off the ground, as well as the uh, National Science Foundation, and most specifically the uh, Physics of Living Systems Student Network for helping out with all of this. Um, and importantly, I'd like to thank Tira Ward uh, from the Emory TMLS, who has been fantastic in helping getting all of this stuff organized. And with that, I'll pass off to Greg. Okay, thank you, Gordon. So uh, first of all, I just wanna welcome everyone to uh, a meeting which uh, became much more popular than we had anticipated, but we're really excited to have all of the speakers. So I wanna thank all of the speakers uh, for coming together. As Gordon mentioned in the email, we have, uh, we have five time zones, three continents, people from all over the place. So I appreciate making time uh, during this kind of rather unusual time across the world. So we gave uh, all the speakers a on purpose provocative title, uh, provocative assignment. So the, and we, we already know that that worked because we already got some feedback that, that we annoyed a few people in the world, which I think is a good sign. Uh, so the idea is that each speaker will give some prepared remarks for 10 minutes. And after those 10 minutes, we will start with a discussion based on those remarks. That discussion will happen within this Zoom, uh, within the Zoom meeting, uh, uh, from all the other participants in the Zoom meeting, and we will at the same time be filtering comments from the, the YouTube, the live YouTube channel, and we will we will pull those comments up to the Zoom meeting as they become sort of accessible to us. So I think uh, this is an experiment. I appreciate both all of our speakers and everyone out there who's watching on the live on the live YouTube channel. So I think uh, we're excited to see how this works and we're ready to get started. Ready, Gordon? Okay, so uh, without further ado, we'll start the meeting. Our first speaker is Sam Reiter. Sam is currently an assistant, uh, an assistant professor and leader of the Computational Neurothology Unit at OIST. His background is in an experimental neuroscience where he studied diverse topics in a range of model organisms, including rat, fly, moth, locust, lizard, turtle, and finally cuttlefish. He studied neuroscience at Brown University, went on to, to graduate school in neuroscience at Brown and at the US National Institutes of Health, and most recently worked as a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research. Sam, lead us off. Okay, well, let me just uh, share the screen here. Thank you, uh, Gordon and Greg, for organizing this uh, this conference. And it's it's great to be able to talk about this uh, this topic with uh, with all of you and everyone who's listening, uh, especially now. Uh, so the the idea that I want to uh, play with um, for the next ten minutes is how much and in what ways does uh, behavior tell us about the brain. So I started thinking about this after working with cephalopods for a number of years. So cephalopods like this octopus has the, have the best camouflage in the animal kingdom. And they can change their texture and their shape and their color at a moment's notice in order to help them hunt for their prey and uh, avoid, uh, avoid predators. 
So if we bring a cuttlefish into the lab and put them into different substrates, onto different substrates, uh, the animal will adopt different camouflage patterns. Uh, so here's one cuttlefish uh, adopting two such patterns. And I've aligned these images so uh, we can blow up the same patch of skin, and that's on the right here. Uh, and you can see that the camouflage patterns are generated through uh, differential expansion of really vast numbers of specialized skin cells called chromatophores. And these are expanded and contracted under direct neural control. So it's motor neurons projecting all the way from the animal's brain to the skin. And these animals can uh, adopt a range of camouflage patterns to, uh, to blend in with their diverse habitats. So as I started studying these, these animals, I was somewhat surprised to find that when the animal was just sitting in a static tank doing nothing by eye, if you uh, zoom in and look at a patch of the animal's skin, so here you see uh, all the different chromatophores, there's just constant spontaneous activity uh, at a range of different spatial scales. So there's both the small localized groups of chromatophores that uh, correspond to a single, you know, common drive from single motor neurons to really largely extended uh, co-fluctuating groups that must be set up from what we know from the anatomy um, by premotor or pre-premotor uh, neural uh, ensembles uh, and whose at least aspects of their dynamics we're seeing play out on this animal's sort of unique skin display system. So, you know, I could go on about cuttlefish, but the, uh, the takeaway I had from this, uh, this line of work was that the closer I looked at this behavior, the more aspects of neural control came into view. And I don't think that this, this theme, I don't think is, is uh, you know, specific to the cuttlefish. Uh, so I think there's many such, so any, many recent uh, studies that highlight sort of this theme. Uh, one such that I can have, that I can talk about is um, Stringer et al, who last year made these really massive neural recordings from visual cortex uh, with calcium imaging and uh, electrophysiology with eight neural pixel probes all over the brain. They can build up these really big neural data sets. And uh, in an homage to, uh, I think to Greg's work, they put a camera on the, the, uh, the, the head fixed mouse's face and uh, extracted eigenfaces. So this is principal component analysis of the motion energy in the video. And by training just a, a simple regression model, they were able to predict a sizable fraction of the activity of primary visual cortex and all the other brain areas that they recorded from, just from the mouse's facial expressions alone. So I think this is really somewhat surprising. Um, it got me thinking about a scale of expressivity. Uh, so you can imagine this in the scale on one end, you would have the imaginary animal who, if you watch its behavior, no matter how, at, at what resolution, it would tell you nothing about what's going on in the brain. Uh, I think this animal is kind of hard to imagine. Like how, how, would, you, how would you do movement? Uh, on the other side of the scale, you, would imagine, you could imagine a science fiction scenario where uh, every aspect of an animal's neural activity is somehow extractable from animal behavior. Uh, I don't think we're, we're there. Uh, I think we're somewhere in between. Uh, it's clear that, that uh, there has to be some neural correlate of all the movements that we can see, emotions, et cetera. But there's, some, there's gonna be some aspects of neural activity that are gonna be forever uh, invisible to just an analysis of animal behavior. And I imagine there's gonna be a range of expressivities where the cuttlefish comes to mind as something particularly expressive. Uh, but I think this recent work sort of pushes us towards the right on this expressiv expressivity scale. And I think it's interesting to ask how far do we go to the right and which ways does, uh, can we learn about the, behavior, uh, the brain from studying behavior alone? Uh, you could also ask, you know, why have such a rich readout of neural activity in animal behavior? I think the answer to this will depend really on the behavior of interest. Uh, for example, pupil dilation has been studied for decades as a faithful readout of arousal and mental load, has recently been uh, linked to particular neurotransmitter systems in the brain. Uh, and as far as we know, uh, this doesn't have any functional significance. It's rather a useful side effect of these neurotransmitter systems activating the arousal system and the autonomic nervous system and dilating the pupil. When you think it's something like emotional behaviors, 
uh, like uh, in a human or has recently been shown in, in mouse facial features or no doubt in many other animals, there's probably a more adaptive explanation uh, in terms of the evolutionary advantage of having uh, a faithful readout of important brain states um, as a signal, uh, especially for social animals that take care of their young. When we return to the, the presence of uh, the movement signals in sensory cortex and other aspects, uh, other areas of the cortex, I think the, uh, the verdict's still out why we see this. Uh, there's been ideas about this being related to internal models and the predicted motor consequences of sensory stimuli, but I think this is a open and really fascinating question. But sort of regardless of the reasons why we have such readout of neural activity from behavior, I think there's some interesting implications of this increased expressivity that we're seeing in the recent work. Uh, stepping back, you know, one of my favorite aspects of uh, this physics behavior approach is that we can go in a data-driven way from you know, video of the animal behaving uh, to uh, a representation of stereotypy and dynamics uh, uh, of an animal. So just uh, for example, from Gordon's work, we can say you know, that there's not one or two different types of fly wing movements, but there's this whole collection of, of similar but distinct uh, and stereotyped wing movements and rules governing the, the dynamics of this. Um, I think this increased expressivity of the brain that we see in animal behavior has implications in that uh, the structure of behavior may be telling us even more than we thought about the, what's going on in the brain, uh, both in how direct it relates to neural activity and which areas of the brain that we learn about from recording the behavior at the suitable you know, spatial temporal resolution. You know, there's lots of phenomena in the brain that are, you know, you could argue most are remain mysterious. Things like noise, trial trial variability that you see in most brain areas, uh, correlated uh, memory potentials, uh, state modulations. Um, a lot of these things, I think because of this increased expressivity we see, uh, stand to be clarified greatly by using these new tracking techniques to uh, probe the you know, neural activity. And uh, lastly, I think there's the potential to carve up in a data-driven way, uh, cognitive, emotional, and uh, brain state variables. So all the internal stuff in a similar way as we have been looking at uh, just animal movement by itself. So for example, you can imagine uh, looking at stereotypy of emotional uh, behaviors. Uh, I think this is fascinating both intrinsically, you know, how many types of happy emotions do we have? How about the mouse and how about the squid? But, uh, but also um, I think it's gonna be critical if we're ever gonna understand the neural basis of these interesting phenomena. Uh, and I'd like to uh, close with uh, perhaps my favorite Tim Brigham quote, who way back in 1963 said, that the no man's land between ethology and neurophysiology is being invaded from both sides. So I think whatever we do with these new tracking techniques, it would be great if a consequence of this was to close that gap. Uh, so with that, uh, Love to hear what uh, what you all think, and uh, thank you very much. Yay! Yay! So I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Sam. And and so now we have uh, about ten minutes for for discussion. I think people are joining the people are joining the YouTube live channel and asking about certificates, uh, but you can also make comments on on the talk that you just heard, and and those will come up to us. So. I will start us off. Sam, I'm wondering, you know, as we build these richer representations of behavior, we have the, the techniques to, to sort of quantify what we see in video like, like we couldn't do before. How do you think we will know when there we can when there when we're we're done analyzing the behavior and we need to go inside the animal and ask questions about what's going on in the neurons or what's going on in the genes. How would we know when to stop analyzing the behavior and add these other signals? Well, I mean, it seems to me like there's a, there's a natural stopping point of when we can measure every muscle and every, uh, you know, every muscle, right? You can do that already in, uh, in some animals. Uh, increasingly, we'll be able to do it in more and more. Uh, I would like it if there would be, you know, we could stop before that, but that that would be the the endpoint, right? If we could do that, then we'd know we have everything. 
And then it's a matter of what can you explain with that? What remains to be explained is, is what we have to go into the brain for. Do you think that there's something that, uh, that from a theory, you know, if, if I'm analyzing the behavior and I don't have all the muscles just yet, yeah. but I'm trying to understand, you know, the, do you think there's something that would in the behavior itself that would signal that maybe we shouldn't try to understand this feature on the behavioral scale only, but you should, you know, in, in lieu of being able to measure uh, more behaviors that you should actually go inside and, and measure, let's say neurons. Uh, like for, for example, but, but, um, yeah, could you clarify? What do you mean? So uh, I'm, I'm measuring animal behavior and yeah. you're, you're saying, is, is there ever a time where it's like, oh, I, I don't understand what I'm seeing. I need to go into the brain. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. I, I, th I think it really depends on the question. I mean, if I'm interested in the sensory world, uh, then yeah, I, I imagine there's aspects of sensory neurobiology that will be, you know, I wouldn't want to study that by studying animal behavior. Um, so yeah, I think it's really question specific. Uh, I can see, I can easily think of ways of, of situations where studying animal behavior would not be the approach that I would want to take. Okay, great, yeah. thank you. I'm what, gonna draw on our other, other panelists. One question that's been coming up a little bit on the, on the YouTube channel is to what extent do you think you need to actually measure the full uh, the full repertoire of either behavioral or emotional repertoire. Like, what, how, how does this? How do you think it affects it if what we're measuring is only some subset or some coarse grain description of that? And how do you sort of resolve that? Um, well, maybe the, I'll take the, the subset and the coarse graining is separate. So the subset, I imagine, you know, in in most laboratory situations, the animal's not doing the full behavioral repertoire, and so if the brain evolved to support that full repertoire, we can at best, if we are studying only a subset, at best study, you know, understand a subset of what's going on in the brain, it seems to me. Uh, the coarse graining, I think, is, is somewhat less problematic. It seems like it's just setting, you know, the maximum resolution at which we can understand what's going on in the brain, if, if it really depends on the fine details. A priori, I, I don't know. Go ahead. Can I jump in with a, with a, I want to relay a question from Ofer Feinerman, which came from the YouTube live channel. So thanks for a great talk. Animals may often want to hide their internal state, act brave yeah. when they are scared, hide an injury. How do you make sure not to be cheated? <laughs> well, so I think, so for, for this and, and a lot of questions, you would need to record the, uh, the brain and the behavior simultaneously to establish some sort of correspondence. Uh, so it would be interesting to, to see that, uh, that it, in certain situations, this expressivity of, of the brain and behavior goes up and down, it's modulated uh, depending on the state of the animal or depending on the, the, the situation. I think that'd be fascinating, um, probably likely. Yeah, that's a good question. So I had a, I had a comment on a question. One was, you both about this axis of uh, how, you know, how, how much expressivity behavior has for what's going on in the brain. So at one end, you said, I, I can't imagine a, a, a situation in which the behavior would tell us nothing about what's going on in the brain. Um, what if the behavior were actually Markovian? Then there are no hidden states. And so the only thing is there exists some state of the brain that corresponds to this behavioral state, and then it goes to the next one, and then it goes to the next one, and then it goes, there's, there's just a mapping. And if you want to know what the mapping is, that's fine. But there's nothing you're going to, there's, there's some sense there's nothing to learn except for what the mapping happens to be, which has an element of arbitrariness to it. Maybe I'm not understanding you, um, but what, what I was thinking was the, the sort of the, the even, the, there's, imagine that there's no information about the brain contained in, in behavior. I, I have tr trouble imagining, you know, that would oh, be okay. a very good Yeah, animal. no, that's, that's but, very hard to do, yes. Yeah. But that, um, that would be the limit of that's right. brain drives yeah. behavior. That's right. Okay, I see. Totally, totally independent objects. This also <laughs> relates to, to Ofer's question about hiding things. Yeah. Uh, in some way, the most interesting thing that you could infer from the behavior is that there are states of the brain which are not immediately visible as states of the behavior. And you can observe the behavior and conclude that if the behavior is not Markovian, right? Absolutely. Okay. So the, the other yeah. question was, 
when you talk about expressivity, there's this old discussion about, you know, what's the information content of behavior and how does that compare yeah. with the information content of our sensory inputs? And, you know, I'm, I, I think there's, there's issues on both sides of that comparison, but the conventional view is we take in this vast amount of sensory data, but we spit out relatively few bits of behavioral data. Yeah. So as I say, I, I think there are issues on both sides of that claim. Yeah. Um, so looking specifically at the, at the, at the cuttlefish, do sure. you think that that's a place where you'll be able, I mean, it looks like because you can vary textures and, you know, things are correlated, but they're not perfectly correlated. Do you think that, that there's, um, that that's a place where you'll be able to make an exception to this usual view or, um, and how would, you know, what's the approach to, to getting at that? And of course, the other question is whether maybe we're just missing something in the other cases, right? That, you know, the amount of information I convey by, by talking to you is not the entropy of, of, the, of a transcript of my speech, right? There's more to it than that. So. Yeah, well, I, I, th I think I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic with the view that, yeah, the behavior is richer than that. But uh, to the cuttlefish question, I, no, I don't think it's 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 going to be a a an exception to this normal rule that the, the there's much more information going in than coming out. Uh, the cuttlefish strikes me as, as quite expressive, but I think it's more just sort of it's convenient to record this really rich behavioral description. It would be possible to do it if we had infinite technology in any other animal, and I don't think it would be much less expressive. Um, the and I, I think that you know the. Although it's it's a quite a complex behavior, this camouflage, uh, you know, almost surely the cuttlefish perceives much more, and it's just the subset of what it perceives that it thinks that's that's valuable to you know, fool the uh, texture discrimination of the, the predators that that ends up you know displaying on the skin, um, plus maybe other things that leak in, uh, which which is an interesting you know question how uh, you know the question of how expressive this this particular system is I think is still still open. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if this does that answer. He had, he had a collection of questions, but yeah. I will jump in with an, uh, another question. So mm. uh, Sam, you've worked on a number of, of systems, many of which I think you wouldn't characterize as the typical genetic model systems. Uh, and I'm curious what you, how do you choose to work on cuttlefish now as a system? Why cuttlefish? Yes. Um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I can make the, 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 the more general point of um, one of the great things about all these tracking behavioral techniques is they don't depend on having sort of genetic access to the animals. And it really, I think, opens up the possibility of making much more broad, doing much more broad and comparative work of studying, you know, the structure of behavior than would be possible, you know, in, in neuroscience where we're sort of, um, uh, hitched to access uh, the, the tools. Um, you know, my choice of cuttlefish was to, I think they're just, you know, really uh, captivating. Uh, and they're the most sort of complex and different animal than I could imagine. I find it really useful to have, uh, you know, to, to work with, you know, the most different example, you know, in terms of an animal as possible that uh, in order to you know, to hope to arrive at more, you know, if, if we can find some commonality between the cuttlefish and a vertebrate, then it would speak to some more general principle. So I think that's the, the, the basic motivation. Great, thank you. So uh, I think we, thank you, Sam. I think uh, we are ready to move on unless there's any any last comments. I think we'll move on. So uh, our next speaker is Ariana Strandberg Peshkin. She's currently a research group leader jointly affiliated with the Ecology of Animal so uh, Societies Department at the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior and the Biology Department at the University of Constance. Originally from Chicago, she, is, she has an undergraduate degree in physics from Swarthmore College and a PhD in quantitative and computational biology at Princeton University. 
She held postdoc positions at the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology and the University of Zurich. She'll be talking about tracking everything, challenges and opportunities for the study of collective behavior. All right, thanks for coming. Uh, you need to Sorry, my, me. yes, got it. <laughs> um, so thanks so much to the organizers for um, inviting me to join in this discussion of what I think is a really um, exciting and very timely topic. Um, so I am, my plan for this talk is to um, tell you first, just briefly sort of where I'm coming from and the research topics that interest me. But um, what I mainly want to do today is to bring up um, through this lens of my own work, some of the challenges that I think are associated with analyzing these types of tracking data, which I hope will be kind of more broadly relevant to the rest of the crowd, even beyond people studying um, collective behavior, um, and hopefully to stimulate some discussion on that. Um, so my research generally sur surrounds the topic of how animals in groups coordinate with one another and how they manage to display emergent patterns such as um, flocking behaviors and, and collective movement, as well as how they manage to come to consensus on collective decisions such as where to go and when to move. And, ah, sorry, I'm just gonna swap the position of this window here, okay. Um, and when thinking about this topic of collective behavior, we often think about trying to infer the individual behavioral rules that um, members of groups are following um, and how these individual behavioral rules scale up to produce collective outcomes, such as collective movement or collective decisions. But we also are interested in looking at and trying to understand the feedback between these collective outcomes and the, and the behavior of individuals, because of course individual behavior is also affected by potentially by group level emergent properties. And in my work, I'm um, I think especially interested in trying to understand um, across a wide range of different species, um, the whether there are common properties um, and common mechanisms of coordination in different types of groups, and also whether there are important differences and what these can tell us about um, both the mechanisms, but also the ecological and evolutionary drivers of such coordinated behavior. Um, and so to do this, my group mainly uses um, high resolution tracking data of animal groups in the wild. So we typically put uh, GPS, and collars and sometimes other sensors on animal groups to be able to monitor their, um, their movements and simultaneously of everybody in the group. Um, so for example, on the right here, you see um, some data from a, a meerkat group that we collected recently, where actually I'm showing here both the movements of the meerkats, but also the, um, the little dots coming up around the bigger dots represent the vocalizations that the meerkats are, are giving. And um, this kind of multimodal data is now um, possible to collect in the wild. And I think it's a really exciting time for trying to link together collective movement and communication. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I really wanna focus on what types of challenges we face when interpreting this type of tracking data. And I'm gonna focus on five different challenges that I've identified that I think are broadly applicable. So the first challenge is um, what to measure. And this is basically, um, let's see if I can get this video playing. Um, and what I mean by that is basically what features of the data that we have um, are useful to answer a particular question. And I think this is something that's really quite difficult when thinking about these types of relatively um, uh, flexible types of data where um, you could really extract many possible features. Um, so just to give an example of this from some of my PhD work, um, in, in that work we were tracking um, baboons. So this video on the left shows some tracking data from a troop of baboons as they move through their habitat. And we wanted to develop, um, we wanted to get some insight into um, how to measure leadership and followership relationships within these moving groups. And one of the um, coming in, I actually came in after the data was collected. And one of the first things that I tried was a kind of standard method that had been used in um, more in, in flocking systems like pigeon flocks um, of using the heading correlations of these individuals. But it turned out that actually completely didn't work. And the reason for that was that um, unlike pigeons, uh, baboons are really moving much less in this very coordinated um, 
and, and continuously moving fashion and much more in this kind of stop go, um, more discontinuous type of movement. And um, one thing that I found to be extremely helpful was I, um, at, after I had been working on the data for a bit, I went out to the field and I actually observed the baboons. And I also talked to a lot of field biologists who had spent a lot of time observing these animals. And based on this, we came up with a, um, a definition of, of um, trying to infer leader fellowship relationships that was um, based on individuals moving away from one another and being followed, which we call pulling. And um, this definition then allowed us to gain a variety of useful insights into the systems. For example, we found that baboons seem to follow the majority um, of their troop mates. And I, I gave this example, I think it's a relatively simple example, but to me it illustrates that um, I think one of the really important um, tools that we have in our arsenal for trying to interpret these types of data is um, our prior knowledge of the biological system. Um, and I think that um, using this, I think we shouldn't underestimate um, the power of actually observing the animals and um, our sort of our own prior knowledge and intuitions about the system here. The second challenge that um, we face is um, what I will call context. And just to give you an example of this, I want to play you two videos. This is again of the baboons. In this first video, you can see here each baboon is moving along, and I'm just showing this on a, a blank background for now. And you can see, you can kind of make what you will of this. And you notice that in the beginning, they were sort of all aligned, and then at some point they split, and then eventually those ones on the right went and followed the uh, majority on the left over there. Um, so now I'm going to show you the same video, but shown where it actually occurred on the Earth. So it's kind of plotted over a Google Earth image. And what you can see is that the alignment of the baboons is actually entirely aligned with this road. And the place where that baboon split is actually exactly at the splitting point of the road. And so to me, this really illustrates that there was an important um, contextual factor and that this road effect um, seems to be really changing the way in which these, these animals are moving and interacting with one another. I think this, um, in this case, is kind of a really obvious um, example that, you know, of course, a, a giant road is, is there that may affect the way they move. But I think it's, in many cases, is very much less obvious um, when you have these sort of different contexts embedded in your data. And it, it, this is basically a general problem that behavior is both probabilistic or at least noisy, but it's also dynamic and constantly changing. And I think we really face, as a field, a, a general question of how do we know when the rules change? Um, and how can we infer these sort of change points and know which which types of data we should aggregate into one model and which types of data we should, and which um, things need to be split up into separate models? Um, and I think a follow up question of this would be: What if the context is what if it's not so discrete and rather the context is something that's more continuously varying? How do we handle it in that situation? The third challenge um, is memory or time scale. So um, my work mostly uh, focuses on uh, social mammals who live in these. Um, stable groups that stay together for many years. So we know in these groups that the short-term decision-making processes like collective movement that we're interested in understanding are going to be strongly affected by the long-term social structure of these groups. For example, certain baboons in a group may groom each other and that may influence then how they, um, whether or not they follow each other. And of course, we also know that the, um, ultimately this long-term social structure has to be built up through these short-term interactions. And so I think this problem of linking together these short-term dynamics with these long-term dynamics is also something that we quite generally face across behavior. And one way that we in my group have been trying to at least start tackling this issue is to try and bring together um, different data sources that um, can, can be um, co complementary in addressing this question. So we can bring together these very high resolution tracking technologies that I've just shown you, um, but in collaboration with long-term field studies where these, these animals groups have been studied for many, many years, um, we can really get a lot of rich contextual and behavioral long-term information that hopefully then can allow us to bridge these long and short timescales. Um, the fourth challenge is, I think, you know, a quite obvious one, which is causality. Um, this is obviously a problem in, across all of, all of science, really, but I think in, especially in collective animal behavior and in other types of complex systems, we have a real problem that um, causality is usually quite complex in that, you know, I may be influencing you, but you also may be influencing me. Um, and so we have these kind of causal loops that are really difficult to untangle. And I guess um, the way that we've been trying to address this here is um, by developing some experimental manipulations, for example, playing certain calls to an animal group that we're tracking to try and um, 
to try and uh, manipulate the system in such a way that we're able to get at these causal factors. Um, and I guess I think the broader point here is that, is that um, even when you can track everything, um, I think you still, um, th there's a tendency to think, okay, now that we can track everything, we can kind of know, um, we can know, un infer everything. But um, if you want to really get at causality, we still need to be thinking out as a field about how we can incorporate some cl uh, clever, clever experimental manipulations. Um, and then finally, the, the fifth challenge that I would like to address is really the question of what to ask. And um, I think one of the really exciting things about being able to track everything is, um, of course, that we can get at answering um, some questions that we already had. But I think, to me, actually, one of the even more exciting aspects of the ability to have these new tools is that they will enable us to generate new questions that we never would have thought of asking. And I, I like to um, compare this to the situation of a sort of traditional naturalist that goes out into nature and observes, observes behavior. And then from those observations, um, sees patterns and then generates questions based on those patterns. And I think what we're seeing now is that we're kind of in a way entering a new era of natural history where we have these new tools that will hopefully allow us to, um, through different types of visualization, um, to better see these patterns that were not that were invisible before, and that will hopefully open up new questions that we hadn't thought to ask before. Um, and so, with that, I wanted to um, thank all of you for listening, and again, thank the organizers. And um, I'd be happy to take questions. Um, I'd also just thought I would, in the spirit of the workshop, kind of ask a question to the the panel myself, which is. Um, just to try and get your opinions on what you think of these challenges. Do they relate to your own research and um, in what ways do they relate? Um, and also in what ways is your field trying to tackle these challenges? So thanks. Hey, thank you, Ari. So uh, does anyone want to jump in and she's, she's I, given a direct challenge? Yes, go for it, Nick. Yeah, can I jump in? Um, so first of all, I, I just want to say that that was that was great. And um, uh, you have the advantage of going before me, but I'm going to say almost exactly the same thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I steal your thunder. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll but I'm glad that we agree, though. <laughs> I'll talk it up for the residual Swarthmore influence. That must be that must be the reason here. Um, one, one. So as I said, I, I think it's great. I think these are these are really, really important things. As as we have the ability to measure more stuff, that puts the onus on us to do something more interesting with it. Um, the issue of context and rules changing, I think, is a really thorny one that we've been thinking about a lot. Um, and I wanted to get your your opinion on one of the angles I've been looking at this through, which is um, if you think about traditional physics, say. Um, we come up with one model of the world, essentially, that's based on first principles that we say, right, which is essentially just conservation laws, uh, principles that we expect are always incontrovertibly true. And the reason that then you get different behavior out the other side is you change the constraints, you change the boundary conditions, you change the initial conditions. So your model is always fixed, but you get wildly different end states by changing the constraints. Um, but the way behavior or collective behavior is tended to work is that we think, oh, maybe we need to change our model every time. So context changes the model rather than changing the constraints. Do you see a way to, to harmonize those kinds of, of approaches to thinking about how you generate models? Um, and I'm curious as your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a really excellent question. I mean, I think that um, I think that with behavior, one of the challenges is that if we were to try and create a model like from first principles of everything and then have constraints be like, for example, the road would be a constraint that, you know, cause the, the rules to change to follow that constraint. Um, I think it kind of becomes an issue of bottle complexity as well, because if we were to, if you can imagine what that model look like, like, it, I don't know, like, I mean, maybe it would come out to be sort of beautiful and like things would all fall into place, but I kind of much more or imagine that you'd be building up this model that would have a, a parameter that it goes up to turn on this part of the model that relates to the, the road following and then another parameter to relate to the, you know, the density of the, yeah. the habitat or whatever. So, like, so, yeah. No, go ahead. That's the severely limit your ability to predict. Yeah, exactly. You have to be changing your model each time. And, and that that's a, it feels to me a little bit more, more amorphous as to how you rationally do that. Um, Whereas I, I, I feel better, but maybe this is just the fact that I'm a physicist. I feel better about tuning my constraints than I do about tuning my model. 
but yeah, I no, I mean, I do, <laughs> <laughs> I do too. I do too. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I guess at the end of the day, you have to be a bit practical about it too, because I think in, in some ways, in some instances, you might be able to come up with a model that unifies things with, you know, a few parameters that then tune the constraints. Um, but I, you know, I could imagine that you might be able to come up with a model for movement decision making that would fall into that category. But I think then if you imagine like drastically, you know, modeling like everything, then I think that would become too complex. So I think maybe there's there's sort of a middle ground. But yeah, I think that's definitely a really interesting issue to, to ponder. Thanks. Thanks. Great, thank you. So um, I wanted to jump in with a question, Ari. Right. You mentioned mm -hmm. that, um, you know, the, the understanding a little bit, the biology of the, of the animals that you're looking at you know, can be, is really important, having some prior knowledge of. And I'm wondering, you know, in the, in the animals that you're studying, you know, the interpretability of the behavior, how important is the interpretability of the behavior? And, and, in, and especially how, how distant the animal is from us. So if we take Sam's cuttlefish or some other crazy, you know, sort of animal, is it, you know, how are we going to interpret what the behavioral context is? Do you, do you see that as, a, as an issue? Do you mean like interpretability of the behavior as, a, as a, compared to say the predictability or like, you know, the prediction no, versus I, interpretation, or is that where you're going? No, or? I mean, I mean, our choice of what we think is important. You know, when you watch animals, uh, yeah. uh, what, we, what we deem as important as humans is, of course, what we deem as important as humans, not necessarily relevant for the animal, although that, that may work in many. So I'm wondering if that ever comes up as an issue for you, where, you know, yeah. how interpretable this behavior has to be, or, or are there other techniques that you might use to sort of identify that as an important motion or important movement? Yeah, I mean, I think that this also ties in with questions about like um, sort of human bias and human perspective and, you know, how we have a different umwelt than, than animals. Um, yeah, I mean, it's difficult. I think it's difficult to say. I think my, I guess my answer might also be sort of a, a bit of a compromise because on the one hand, I do think that these types of biological insights um, and our human perception are important to as a starting place to like make sense of anything. Um, but on the other hand, I do think it's also important that we that we don't take those as as truth, you know, that we that we challenge our pre existing assumptions and our pre existing knowledge. So I think it's a bit of a sort of like um, explore exploit type trade off. Um, and that's where I think um, in, I guess in my talk, like I was I was thinking of the two the two, the first and the last challenge as being kind of, kind of complementary to one another because on the one hand we want to use our biological knowledge to know what to measure, but then on the other hand we want to make sure that we can, from the data itself, in a hopefully in a less biased way, figure out what you know what how to adjust our our biological knowledge and how to adjust the questions that we're asking about the system. Um, Right. Yeah, so I think both of those need to be going on. Great. So let, let me jump in with a few questions that are pulled from the audience. Uh, so from Olivia Goldman, fascinating talk. As you suggested, are there any principles that have started to emerge related to commonalities between different species' collective behavior? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are a variety of different principles that um, are more or less generalizable. I mean, certainly I think one of them would be sort of positive and ne negative feedbacks as a general principle, like, you know, a, a, as a way of at least understanding the system that, you know, positive feedbacks would be like things like copying behaviors and majority rule and negative feedbacks would be sort of inhibition. And I think um, those kind of constructs can be usefully applied across multiple different systems. Um, Yeah, and I mean, it's it's hard to say like the, what are exactly the the principles that have emerged like generally speaking. Um, I think it's been there's been a lot of ability to take um, mathematical tools from one system and apply them to another system. Um, 
but I think that is kind of the question in collective behavior or like the most popular question would be sort of, can we extract more generalizability um, across these systems? Right. Perfect, thank you. Uh, there's, a, there's a few more comments I wanna get through. Uh, this I think is just a comment from Rowan Egnor. Nice talk, exclamation point. Eve Martyr said, when our tools weren't as good, we had to think more. I like the focus on causality and experimental manipulation. That's just a comment. Uh, and then there's a, there's a question from Ilya Nemanman. Uh, he's gonna ask this question of just about every speaker. So we'll just get that question out and everybody can think about it. What does success look like? Uh, sorry, with, I need to open my screen a little bit. Uh, sorry. What does a sex, su success look like with a contr contrarian hat on? What will we learn besides a really big database? You can take the first crack at that, Ari, and then we'll, we'll have other comments. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do think this has to go. So I think that we, as a field in collective behavior, we are in a bit, still in a bit of an exploratory phase, like what, you know, what I was mentioning about how we are having all these types of new data and we are in some ways still in the process of generating, of figuring out what are the patterns that are in this, these data sets. I guess the hope would be that at some point, and I think this is again where the sort of trying to extract generalities across systems comes in. The hope would be that we can extract some meaningful general framework to put this in, but that also leaves room for um, interpretation of the variability, um, which I think is actually equally important. You know, if, if I think we, we tend to focus a lot on can we find common principles across systems in the in collective behavior from the sort of physics vantage point, whereas I think biologists have focused much more on the uh, how can we explain all this variability. Um, so it's kind of an interesting um, it's an interesting tension in the field. So I, I think um, the variability. So I, I think we need to do both simultaneously because if we can understand what are the general principles, then we can also try and understand, okay, what does it mean that this principle um, maybe is either doesn't apply or is applying in this certain particular way in this system and what, and hopefully eventually we, we might be able to link that to um, sort of the ecological constraints that the system, that the species is, is facing or the evolutionary underpinnings of their behavior. So that would be my crack at that. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. I think we'll we'll move on to our next speaker. That's okay with our with our panel. So the next speaker is uh, Andre Brown. Andre is currently a leader of the behavioral genomics group in the integrative biology section of the MRC London Institute of Medical Science. With background in physics, he loves the interplay between theory and experiment that characterizes physicists' approach to science but at the same time is fascinated by the intricacy that you can see at every scale in biology from molecules inside cells to animals interacting in a population. He'll be talking at the title of his talk is what have we done with all the tracking data? Andre, it's all yours. Thank you, uh, Greg. Uh, and um, yeah, so thank, thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, speak here. It's been a really interesting workshop already and I've uh, sort of been derailing my own talk in my head in response to all the sort of different points people have been raising, which is a good sign, I think. Um, so maybe uh, to, to start my introduction, I'd say that we're, we're interested in uh, genetics and, and in Sam's expressivity terms, I guess we're interested in uh, also where we sit in that uh, sort of spectrum of expressi expressivity, thinking in terms of uh, genes rather than neurons. So how much information can we get about genetic variation from looking at behavior? Um, and of course, uh, the critical question then is how you measure behavior and, um, and, and how, we, how we quantify it. And that's what we spend uh, a lot of our time thinking about. Um, so the reason I, I turned around the question a little bit to say, what have we done with uh, all the tracking data rather than now that we can track uh, most everything, what should we do? Is that working on C. elegans sometimes feels a little bit like uh, you're living in the future. And uh, to explain that a little bit, um, let me say uh, with this timeline, I think a big part of where this question from our workshop organizers came from was the recent sort of renaissance of uh, deep learning, um, the uh, accurate uh, pose estimation algorithms that have come out uh, for tracking humans, and then in 2018, these as they're adapted uh, specifically for working uh, with, with animals, uh, and the 2018 publication of, of Deep Lab Cut and, and Leap. Um, because 
once we got to that point, we were able now to uh, do reasonably high resolution tracking and estimate pose of complicated animals in complicated circumstances. And that is indeed uh, very important and very exciting. Um, but if we uh, look to the left on this timeline and think about where we are in C. elegans, the first um, uh, paper that I'm aware of analyzing um, you know, quantifying behavior in C. elegans at the level of uh, poses like this was in 2002. And so Bayek et al. already used uh, some admittedly much simpler, but uh, computer vision algorithms to uh, segment and uh, skeletonize worms. And of course, if you have that accurate skeleton, you have uh, exactly a uh, high resolution and accurate estimate of the animal's pose. And already in this first paper, uh, they then extracted some handcrafted features and they trained a classifier to um, uh, quite accurately classify a handful of mutants uh, into their, uh, uh, you know, it predict the mutant class uh, accurately based only on those mutants' behavior. So they've got some great success <clears throat> from a paper that's almost, uh, almost 20 years old. And um, I think a, a really important moment uh, for the physics of behavior and certainly for, for me was uh, this paper by uh, Greg and uh, Bill Bialik and Will Rue, um, which for me was a real sort of watershed moment where they took this um, accurate pose estimation, which was possible. And they said, how should we think about this data? What's the best way to uh, represent it? And they came up with this um, now quite famous idea of doing uh, principal component analysis on these uh, postures. And they found that a relatively low dimensional representation, so just four of these so-called eigenworms could account for a, a good fraction of the variance of all of the behavior. Um, so what that meant was that you could now represent behavior basically as these four numbers that are labeled here as A1 through four. And those basically captured most of what you would want to know about how a worm is moving around on a plate uh, and they went further then and talked about um, the sort of dynamics of uh, these trajectories in this shape space as a way of thinking about the behavior. Now, that is, I think, maybe the most enduring thing uh, that comes from that paper. It's certainly been very influential on our work and on uh, many other people. Uh, but I think in some ways, the most important figure in that paper or, or the most, the thing that really um, caught my eye about that paper was, it comes from the last figure. Uh, which, is, which is this one. Uh, so what you see here is the um, amplitude of the third mode, which roughly captures uh, turning behavior. At time zero, you see the um, uh, stimulus being applied. This is an isotropic thermal stimulus. They uh, uh, gave the worms with an idle laser. And if you just naively looked at this data and you sort of pooled the um, turning response over all the animals, you'd find basically that there's not much response. That's the gray line. So on average there, there doesn't seem to be much going on. But if you look a little bit more carefully and you see where are they in, this, uh, in the phase of this uh, oscillation, then suddenly you see this great separation. Um, basically where if an animal is bending uh, dorsally and you hit it with a stimulus, then it responds by turning ventrally. Whereas if it's bending ventrally, uh, it'll respond by turning dorsally. And on the right-hand side, you can see a couple of examples where they've used this to actually uh, do some uh, sort of uh, control of worm behavior. And again, using this isotropic stimulus applied to the body, get the worms to turn uh, either clockwise or uh, counterclockwise, depending on the timing of the stimulus. So sort of together, what this suggested to me was that you could take a principled look at this relatively complex looking behavior, come up with relatively simple um, uh, sort of insights to come up with a basis that explains that behavior, and then derive unexpected insights from that and even get some sort of powerful control over your system. So that really looks like the, you know, a dream outcome for the physics of behavior, right? We're, we're, we're going in with this sort of physics idea and coming out with um, uh, new understanding and, and new tools to, to see what's going on. Um, so uh, I, I first saw the, uh, Will Rue talking about this at an APS March meeting before I actually worked on behavior. Uh, but once I did start working on behavior around 2009 or 2010, uh, I went back and read the paper very carefully and, uh, and, and started working in this direction. Um, and so I just wanted to, I don't really have time to, to go into any detail, but um, a couple of directions that we've taken this. So um, again, thinking about this, uh, this, this trajectory, uh, this plot on the left is just the uh, first three dimensions uh, of uh, a worm behaving over time, traveling through this space. We wanted to ask, well, uh, you know, if we take some behavior principles that we know uh, or that we think we know uh, might be useful in understanding behavior, where does that get us? And so one that we were interested in was stereotypy. If we take the idea that um, animals repeat important behaviors uh, at different times, can we automatically detect some of those stereotype behaviors and will that be useful for anything? So we um, 
uh, develop this concept of a behavioral motif that we could detect in the time series of these four uh, mode amplitudes. And that turned out to be relatively useful for uh, clustering different mutants. So again, if our goal is to sort of get insight into genetic variation from phenotype, that seemed like a, uh, a successful sort of application of this approach or of this representation. Um, but we weren't totally satisfied that at least as we had done it, this uh, description of stereotype behaviors was quite sparse. We were focusing on a small set of, uh, of highly stereotyped uh, behaviors. So we also looked then at uh, alternative ways of getting uh, a larger fraction of the repertoire. And so one approach to doing that was to discretize the behavior just into a set of template postures and consider the transitions between those postures over time. And so then we looked at um, methods from uh, language modeling, for example, to try to understand the types of sequences that we see and um, how those can be useful, again, for uh, distinguishing worms in different conditions or, or uh, worms with different genetic backgrounds. And one of the things that that did reveal was that worm behavior was remarkably complex. Uh, basically, you had to look for a very long time before you started to get to an appreciable fraction of the total um, behavioral repertoire. So even for this relatively, uh, some people say simple uh, animal, there was a lot of complexity, even just in their spontaneous locomotion um, on, a, uh, on an agar dish. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and we took that a little bit further to say, well, what are the important sequences? And we took a sort of experimentalist's version of an uh, information theoretic approach and used a compression algorithm to try to identify some important sequences um, and build hierarchies of these postures. And that also proved useful for uh, comparing different strains to each other. So that is sort of starting from this inspiring physics of behavior point where it sort of led us. And to answer the question, uh, if you're working on an organism where tracking has suddenly become possible at a uh, sort of resolution and accuracy that wasn't previously possible, what you should do with that data, I think a great place to start is to go back and read that paper, look at uh, some of the threads in other people's works inspired uh, and see if that's relevant for, uh, for the organisms you're working on. Um, but I just wanted to end with um, a sort of uh, frustration in, in, that's characterized my, my work over this time, which is that although I like these uh, principled, principled approaches, they've given us some insight into uh, the structure of worm behavior and they've proven useful for some of the tasks we want to accomplish. We have this other approach, which I think in some ways is much less elegant, but has proven to be more powerful for some of the problems we care about. Um, and so this has sort of gone on in, in parallel. Um, so Ev Yumini, uh, when he was a student in Bill's lab, basically continued developing this approach that I talked about from Bayek et al, this, uh, this 2002 paper. So he's improved the tracking hardware. Uh, they were using VCRs in 2002. Uh, Ev's moved to using at least digital cameras, uh, but continuing to develop these handcrafted features that try to capture something we think about uh, worms and what we think might be important for their uh, phenotype. Um, we've continued to do that. Oh, I should say that, uh, you know, in terms of uh, speaking of the, the sort of power of this approach, um, it, one of the things we applied it to was a set of 300 mutants that uh, we had tracked and 76 of those 300 mutants had no previously described uh, phenotype, but using this uh, approach of writing down all of the things we thought might be important for behavior, we were able to identify um, some phenotypic difference in the behavior of all of these um, organisms, even for these ones with more subtle um, phenotypes. So that sort of showed the, the, the power of that approach. And uh, we've continued to develop that approach and we've continued to find that it's uh, successful. So this is just a schematic of some of these uh, features we're extracting, which are, which are very similar to the ones I've uh, worked on. Um, and this is a confusion matrix uh, using these features to classify some uh, different wild isolates of C. elegans. If you're on the diagonal, in this uh, approach, then you are correctly classified by um, a classifier trained on these features. And you can see that most of the points are on the diagonal. We still haven't been able to achieve this level of accuracy with our other methods. And that's a sort of source of frustration for me. So I'll just leave you with this uh, sort of idea that the um, physics of behavior approach is, I think, um, very inspiring. I think it's very promising. We're continuing to push in that direction. But you have to keep in mind that for some of the tasks you're working on, maybe a uh, simpler, less elegant approach is actually going to be better. So while we're trying to develop a sort of statistical mechanics of behavior, we should keep doing a thermodynamics of behavior. And it might even be that by trying to understand steam engines, uh, behaviorally speaking, it's, it's going to get us closer to where we want to be. If you want to play with any of this data, we've put a, a large behavioral data set uh, online, um, which you can uh, search and download. And I'll finish by thanking uh, the current members of my lab uh, on the left. Um, and the uh, 
collaborators that we've worked with over the years, including especially the first authors for the papers I talked about, who are Alex gomez Barin, uh, Avelina Haver, uh, Eb Umini, and Roland Schwartz. And thank you for the uh, chance to present this. Great. Thank you, Andre. Excellent. So I'll just put in a plug for, for thermodynamics, because that's where we first learned about entropy, if you remember all the way back to, to Carnell. So yay, thermodynamics. Uh, Andre, I'm going to, you're going to be the, you're going to bear the first brunt of this grumpy comment from Dan Goldman. So great. Uh, cranky Dan Goldman has been holding his tongue, but now must say, say this, which I've expressed to the organizers. In my experience, we can track almost nothing. What we can track reliably of say organism behavior tends to be one in rather pristine non-physiological environments and two kinematic, which often tells you little about the behavioral goal. Yeah, great. Um, so I, there, when I was preparing my talk, I, I was sort of thinking of two versions. One is the version I just gave you, uh, and the other was going to be uh, roughly along these lines of saying, well, it's great what we can do, but what about all the things we can't do? And sort of emphasize places where we still need better recording, better measurement. Uh, from our perspective, one of the things we need is still higher throughput. We've been increasing our throughput for quite some time, but there are still a lot of problems we're very interested in where we just need much more data. And so that's another direction we've been pushing in. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a very good point. Um, it, you know, it, it, even in worms, Greg, as you know well, uh, it can be quite difficult to um, uh, skeletonize, you know, slightly more difficult poses or overlapping worms. Um, so even in the most pristine uh, circumstances with the morphologically simplest organisms, we still have tracking challenges. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, we, we can do a lot with what we have, but uh, we'll be able to do even more with even better tracking more tolerant to more complex environments. Um, but, you know, it, we might not be there yet, but I think the, the progress has been incredible. The, the difference from what was possible in 2002 and what's possible now is, uh, is astonishing. Great, thank you, Andre. Other, other comments from our, from our panel? I had a question. Uh, it wasn't clear to me, uh, what is contained in your alternative, sort of your, your handcrafted features? The, in terms of that representation, what what is in there that's not in uh, the you know tracking hundred points along the body? Yeah, I, I, I wish I knew. I wish I knew in a in a way uh, <laughs> in a satisfying way I could explain that. That's been one of the frustrations because you know if you take uh, let's say you take more than four eigenvalues, let's say you take you know eight, then you get up to very close to you know explaining all of the variance with those postures. Let's say you add in. Um, you know, translation and rotational speed, you should have everything, right? It's all, it's all in there. Um, so the, the question then is, is where is that sort of information hiding? If you look at the kinds of things we're measuring, we're measuring curvature at different points on the body. We're measuring speeds of different parts of the body. Uh, we have some measures of relative speed. We have some measures of path and its curvature. Nothing that in principle is not encoded in the dynamics of uh, the eigenwords if you take enough of them. But in practice, the representations we're using on, say, the eigenorm, eigenorm dynamics aren't there yet. They don't perform as well. There are just these subtle differences. And, and I should also say they're smeared out across our features in ways that are difficult to understand. It's not that we can say the key point here, you know, the reason we weren't performing as well with, say, uh, something based on eigenworm dynamics was because we weren't considering the speed of the tail when the worm was moving backwards. It doesn't come, it never comes down to something that simple. It's just that when you put in that sort of bag of features that, that covers that full range, on average, you end up learning a little bit more. So this sort of incremental bit that you get from each feature is small, but together they just perform better. Um, so, you know, it's, it's in practical terms, it performs very well. Uh, and even though we've tried to make the features as simple and interpretable as possible, in the end, the difference between strains is sort of smeared across them in a way that's difficult to understand. So there's certainly more work to be done in making them more understandable and, and probably also still um, uh, more informative. But that's the hope certainly that we're going to eventually get to a point where we can start with some principled analysis of the dynamics and also have a very powerful um, uh, method of phenotyping. I, I want to raise two points. So one is just a answer or one comment on this question that was raised. I think, I think computer vision has really pushed the ability to track in the wild of humans easily on in un, untrained, no additional data, no matter what the background, and we can get really highly reliable um, readouts. And 
and and I mean this was an achievement of many many people over many years. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to actually ask as a question to Andre was, uh, Andre, um, how do you how did you measure performance in what you just were discussing? Yeah, so this of course is a very very important point because if you're and, and also relates exactly I think to to Ilya's point of what success looks like. Um, you know, there, there are certainly some ways in which the other representations I talked about are much more successful. You know, I like the idea that when we looked at the postural syntax, we were sort of able to quantify in an interesting way the complexity of the behavior, which would absolutely not have been apparent from a simple list of handcrafted features. It would not have just sort of jumped out at you. So, you know, if performance in that sense is, is sort of nebulous, say, insight, understanding, something like that, which is extremely important. Um, when I was talking about performance of these features, I was specifically talking about, uh, say, a classification problem of trying to classify different worm strains um, into groups. Now, um, in one sense, maybe that's just a proxy for uh, uh, the usefulness or informativeness of the features, but there are cases where classification really is the problem we absolutely care about. So, for example, one of the things we're trying to do is treat worms with uh, different drugs and predict the mode of action of those drugs because many, um, uh, especially pesticides and antelmintics, uh, you know, nematode killing compounds are discovered in phenotypic screens. That problem is really important, being able to predict what the mode of action is. And that is exactly a classification problem. So in some cases, really, uh, the, the performance is, is really well-defined and it is classification. So it's, it, it's not, not, not just a straw man. Let me, let me bring up two comments from the, uh, from <clears throat> the YouTube stream. So first one, can you further explain the idea of thermodynamics of behavior and how it might relate to genetic correlates? Probably, probably not, uh, <laughs> not in a satisfying way. I, I guess uh, really what I mean is um, that, you know, there, there's a way of looking at, if you're thinking in terms of statistical mechanics and you're thinking in terms of sort of microscopic models of what's going on that are consistent with kind of macroscopic laws or regularities that you can observe, then, Th those, those, those macroscopic laws and regularities are, are explained by the microscopic um, uh, uh, principles and theories, uh, but often you have to discover those regularities first. You have to, you know, you have to empirically discover gas laws and uh, these sorts of things before you can uh, develop your statistical mechanical theories. And I think very loosely speaking, something like that is probably true for behavior as well. Um, you know, it gets back to thinking about context and, and, um, and things, you know, what, what are really the important uh, variables and behavior that we want to understand. And I think we're going to have to just continue to do uh, some sort of careful quantitative empirical work to draw out those laws, which is what I mean by sort of the thermodynamic angle. Uh, in terms of how that, how that relates to genetics, uh, well, uh, a bit more difficult to, to, to say. Any, any regularities you see might be useful phenotypes for doing genetics. Um, maybe your statistical mechanical uh, version of that would be even more useful. Perfect. Thank you. I think, uh, thank you again, Andre, for your talk. I think uh, we'll move on now to, uh, this is going to be, we're, this is going to be the last talk before we take a short break and then, and then Gordon will take over moderating. So our next speaker is uh, Ugna Kleibate. Uh, no, not Almost. even close, sorry. <laughs> Almost. Uh, she's currently a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University and did her PhD at the Center uh, for Physics of Biological Function at Princeton University. She's going to talk about more data, more interesting problems. Thank you, Ugna. Um, uh, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Can you see me? You? All right. I'm going to apologize in advance if my movies don't work, but I just can't bear to not include them. So you know, we'll see. Um, okay, so uh, today I'm gonna talk about uh, mouse behavior in the open field. Um, mo data, mo problems. And these problems are great and cool and fun. And like, I, I, think, I think this recent era of tracking has really made um, the, the stuff we can find in behaviors like so much more interesting. And I think it, it, um, it suggests that we should take a look back at things that we have used um, in, in more sort of um, rigid tests, like, uh, and and sort of look again and see what else we find. And maybe um, as we've been speaking about, maybe sort of um, talk about some new questions that we can answer instead of just uh, considering what, what we've seen before. So uh, this test, what I'm showing you now, and I don't know, sorry if this video is not, not doing great, but um, this is a mouse running around in an open field. And, um, you know, previously people, uh, would um, put this mouse into the field and let it run around for 
um, 10 or 20 minutes in this box with no stimuli um, and uh, sort of look at some very um, basic measures of what it did and use these to distinguish between maybe different models of disease or the effects of different drugs or different genetic backgrounds. And so often what you would get um, if, you, if you read about this is, uh, or if you look at a figure in a paper, um, in an old paper like this, you'd, you'd see something like um, the total distance traveled. So here, this, this mouse that I was showing was one of these um, uh, black six wild type lab strain mice. And you'd see that, oh, they, they travel, you know, some consistent amount maybe over the course of 20 minutes. Um, uh, or the total time that they spent in the center. So if I show you a centroid trace of uh, that mouse that we were just watching, you might say, okay, let's define some box here and uh, say how long, um, what fraction of the time, of the total time did the mouse spend in, in some region. And so these would be sort of scalar values uh, that would be assigned and, and used um, a, as uh, sort of proxies for behavior. And so um, I hope to convince you by the end that uh, we find way more interesting things if we revisit this with new tracking technologies and we can get at um, you know, time scales, habituation over days and, and new ways to compare these uh, models of disease. So, um, oh, right, and just, just introduce, I'm, I'm gonna be briefly talking about just two different common uh, mouse models of autism. And just the way I've set this up is I have three sort of from each group, the negative, the heterozygote and the homozygote. Um, and then are also mostly I'll be focusing on this wild type. And so for um, each of these categories, I have about a dozen um, mice that were put into the same arena um, for four subsequent days each for 20 minutes. And in the wild type case, I have 60 mice that uh, had the same treatment. Okay, so just a little bit more, um, just like a final thought on this open field. I think it's really cool because it, it's sort of, there's, there's a lot of, um, uh, criticism of it, actually, you'll often see it alongside other constrained behavioral um, tests. And, you know, you get these small scalar parameters out and a lot of people say, well, this doesn't really measure anything or, you know, we use it as a proxy for anxiety, but what does that really mean? And so to me, this is really cool from our perspective, because yes, it's kind of constrained. It gives you nice videos. You, you can, you know, you, you can get, people have gotten some scalar from it, but also we can really study something more spontaneous um, in, in this sort of clean environment. So, uh, and I'll show you what we find. Okay, so, and luckily somebody, Sam introduced this pipeline, so thank you. Um, uh, so I think, you know, most of us are familiar um, with, yeah, Greg and Gordon's work um, on quantifying animal behavior in an unsupervised way. So just briefly, uh, so here's sort of a, a cutout of the, the mouse video that I was showing. And here we've applied, uh, we train a neural network using LEAP to track certain features, um, certain joints of the animal. And so now over time, we have some sort of signal that tells us what, what the coordinates were doing. So for example, during that grooming bout that we were just watching, we might see that there are these ripples in where the nose position is um, in, in relation to the center of the mouse. So we, we might say, okay, this is a signal we should be able to capture. Um, and, and the same for, for locomotion, these, these paw joints, you know, they, the, the paws move relative to each other. And we're like, we really should be able to pick this out uh, using signal processing. So uh, just briefly, we, we have these um, videos, we have the labeled joints. What I do is I take sort of distances between them um, I, and I uh, do a PCA on this. So this sort of captures the positions of all the joints um, and, and just, just encodes something about the posture of the animal. And then if we do a wavelet decomposition, that tells us something about how the animal is moving. So the dynamics. And from there, we can do, you know, various types of clustering to, to try to define classes of behavioral, behavioral categories. So here I do uh, a k-means clustering and, you know, get out a hundred little behavioral types. And then I look randomly at, okay, type number one, what, what, what was the mouse doing every single time I called it behavior number one? And so I might give it a name, right? I say, okay, these all look like locomotion. Um, I see another one. Okay, this is some kind of, you know, sniffing, exploring. Um, and I do this over and over again. So here's grooming. And I'll do this over and over again and find, look through all of the behaviors that I had and, and see, see everything that happened really in all of these mice over time. So um, just as an aside, and this is not important really, but 
I'm going to use this sort of state space to um, to represent how behavior occurred. So the the area of this plot corresponds to how much of this fast locomotion occurred. So you can see here for one animal, you know, this animal did some sniffing, some grooming, and this, this shows the transitions between these things. And really, the way I make this is I also do um, a nonlinear embedding. So people might be familiar um, with Gordon's work. And, and I, make, I make sure that those things match up with my clustering, and they do. So that's a nice uh, sanity check. All right, so oh, I hope this plays. OK, so really, the end of all that is that we have these different behaviors, what I consider the repertoire of the open field behavior in the mouse. Um, and so you know, it, it's apparent that the things you're picking up are the way that the joints are moving, and we can really classify these things, right? And so you know, everything from really slow stuff to grooming to different types of locomotion. And so, OK, we can do something basic. The obvious thing is, each mouse spent 20 minutes in the box. How, how long did it do each thing? And so, yes, these things change from, from day to day. They are different across conditions. Um, and you know, different behaviors exhibit different patterns. So that's something that we could have really done by just watching the animal and hand counting these things. Um, however, now we can say, over time, what's happening? So if I now look at one individual, or all of the individuals, at three minute windows, a sliding window over the entire time that they spent in the box, I can come up with a frequency of, of how often each behavior was performed. And we see that that representation that we were showing before is does not capture really what's going on. Because the amount of locomotion, the average amount doesn't tell you that they were running a lot in the beginning and, th and this value dropped a lot. And then by, the, by day two, they um, started also kind of high, but not as high as day one, um, et cetera. And so, this type of pattern shows you what's going on over many days, and uh, and so so we can track track some of these um, time scales that that classically uh, could not be done. Okay, just a few more things. Okay, so this I think is a is very useful uh, for for looking at differences between these strains. So now we do the same thing um, for our one of our autism phenotypes, right? These mice are somehow different and we wanna see how. And so here's our homozygote and uh, I dropped out the colors, but you know, red is locomotion, this green is um, this exploring thing and, the, and this light blue is grooming. And so we see that this one, the grooming phenotype just never never goes up as high as it does in the, in the control. So we can look more closely and say, okay, over all the individuals of each of those um, genetic backgrounds, what, what was going on? And so we can draw you know, a line with a confidence interval and, and see that, wow, yes, the homozygote never really achieves this behavior. Um, so this is something we might've captured if we were looking at just total amount. However, something like this, where they all might've done uh, a comparable ab amount of exploration or sniffing, um, especially in, in the later days, we might see that it takes them longer to habituate. Uh, so something about, um, the evolution of this behavior over day one might be different. And so now that we can sort of parameterize these things, we can, we can assign a number maybe to the slope and compare our animals like that. Okay, so, oh, it's kind of playing. Okay, well, okay. So here's just a sample ethogram sort of putting everything together. I don't have time to talk about uh, lots of the different features, but you can see that there are sort of patterns that, that you want to just look at and say, OK, I, there's something going on with these transitions. There, there's, there's clearly a pattern of what this animal is doing. Um, and we can, we can begin to track those. And so um, I'm out of time, probably out of time. OK, so just as a final thought. Oh, OK. Oh, sorry. Not a final, a second to final thought. And we can, al we can also show yeah, how this changes. Oh, OK, sorry. Just looking at the clock, um, so we can we can see how this changes from day to day, and sort of instead of looking at a single behavior and saying, "Oh, it grooms more on day two than day one," we can look at the entire structure of these things and say, "Oh, wow, there's 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 very much a pattern in which types of behaviors um, or which groups of behaviors change," and so maybe that's something um, that we can use to parameterize this. And so, okay, finally, um, I'll just show here's the same mouse, um, and here's minute one of its exploration of this open field and minute 18 and the, um, the corresponding ethograms. And so you're sampling from this first one, you know, from, from somewhere early in this curve. And you can see that it's doing a lot of that kind of stuff. And then here you're sampling from later and you're seeing that, yes, it does a lot more of this uh, slow stuff, um, a lot more exploration. So we really want to find a way to describe that process, that evolution. And so one thing that I've sort of come up with, uh-oh, uh-oh, stop.
uh -oh. is, is this kind of representation. Um, okay. Well, okay. So one thing you can do is look at how this thing changes over different windows of time. So perhaps, sorry, this is, uh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I knew all my videos would crash this thing. Um, well, you get it. I can't tell what's crashed. Do you want to? Do you want to just explain what's on the slide that we should be paying um, attention? Yeah, sorry. I, I think my just my just computer just crashed. Oh, your whole computer crashed. That's, a, that's oh, no. okay. Oh no! Oh wait, wait, wait. All right, got it, got oh, there it. Okay. It right. Yeah. So just instead of instead of showing you know what's happening on a on a frame to frame basis or as a summary, I can sort of draw this um, state space, this behavioral state space for for smaller and smaller windows and see how quickly things change together. And I think this also gives us a way to, to visualize what's happening. Um, yeah, and so finally, it's probably this that crashed it. I, I had I just had to include all these movies, but um, thank you to everybody who I, I get to work with and talk about this stuff with and for uh, Greg and Gordon, obviously, for letting me talk. Great, thank you, yay. Okay, I have a couple comments. Uh, I'll start with mine, which is, what if you have more than one mouse? Then you have sort of postures of each individual mouse, right? As, as you showed really nicely, but you have this relative space between, you know, that, that how do you think about, you know, if we're gonna connect to, to work from Ari or, or, or Nick or, or the collect, you know, how do we connect postures and multiple animal behavior? I'm, wor I'm wondering about that. Yeah, I mean, I this is what I worked on in flies, sort of social behavior. And uh -huh. the way I think of it is um, I, I would try to isolate each individual and see what they're doing on an individual level and then try to find parameters that relate what they're doing, you know, at the same time. So uh, do you have some shared information? Is there communication happening? And, you know, causality, like Ari said, is really hard in these systems, but uh, mm -hmm. but we know we know it's happening. We know that, that there's there's back and forth between them. I actually yeah, just then, to follow to follow up on that. Sure. Um, I, I was curious to know if during your work on the social behavior you had thought about and or also tried looking at sort of joint states like the joint set of the behaviors as your um, as your original space and then tried to categorize see whether you come up with sort of joint collective states. Was that something that you ever looked into because I've been sort of thinking about this topic as well and um, I don't know whether it's I don't know how interpretable it would be, but I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I found, so I found that doing this processing step, I really take each one by itself just because we wanna be able to embed them into the same space and say, okay, I know who's running, I know who's grooming. Um, but then I think that the big upshot of my, my work with social flies is that they, they tend to do stuff, they tend to synchronize behavior more than expected, right? So they tend to groom together more than expected. So that I think in that case, you are sort of looking at the joint space and seeing that that there's structure there. Okay, I also have a comment from David Fisher. Did or can you consider self loops in behavioral straight transition network, and what would that add? Did or can probably not did maybe can. Um, sorry, I'm not really. <laughs> I'm not really sure. But loops. Yeah, loops. Can you can you um. I can't clarify. Can you clarify? <laughs> that, 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 that's it. Here's here's another here's another comment. How do you quantify and compare state changes between mice mice strains, and how do you give functional meaning to this? That's from Lakshmi, or sorry, that's from Lux. Excuse me. Right. So I, I think I sort of I'm I'm showing this as a part of the process. Like I'm definitely not there where I'm satisfied with um, the comparisons I'm making, but I think I'm finding a lot of these things that that are giving us the tools to be able to compare strains in this really high level way. So for example, uh, that last sort of slide where you see one individual moving in you know, a, very a very fast way, a very active way, and in, in another one, it's got a totally different pattern. If we can find a way to sort of um, call that something, you know, or parameterize that in a way that we, we find that there's only so many states that animals show, and then we can find a difference. You know, we, we can actually have a scalar value. Instead of saying, oh, an animal traveled this far, it, now it will be, this animal spent a lot of time in this state 
that you know we can correctly or not say oh it's more it's more anxious or it's you know it's uh it's scared or something but i i think there is is um is room to do that kind of thing great perfect thank you uh are there any comments from yeah, so I had, so there was, there's one, I don't know if actually this was for Andres or for your talk with them, but um, let's, I'll ask anyway. So David Pritchard is asking, so some physics of behavior points towards things like stereotypy, which feels like old school 1930s, 1940s, 1950s ethology. So in his words, is there a risk of just using new technology to better describe what we already know? Or do you feel like we're actually fundamentally, like, are we, like, maybe to rephrase a bit, are we just quantitatively showing ideas that have been in the that have been in the literature for a long time by doing this stuff, or is what's sort of the hope of getting something that's new out of it? I think that is an awesome question, and I think that really captures what what I'm interested in, which is why I start with this test, and I, you know, these tests that are sort of really um, like, like forced choice things, where you, where you really just want a number and you really want an answer is so different from the ethologist perspective where we watch an animal and see what it does on on the animal's you know own terms and i think we're starting to get to a point where we can maybe relate some of these things so we don't want to lose the idea of of the test right because it's it's super important we're not going to be able to do neuroscience and trials and you know like neural recordings without, without having some sort of structure like that but also we we can think about the the value that we're measuring as something more complicated and, and as a combination of these things that before were you know sort of the only things we could measure, and therefore they were the things we did measure. Okay, I think I think that's a good place to break. So I want to thank our first set of speakers for for logging in and, and paying attention, and everyone out there for for your great comments as this as this is running forward. Now we have scheduled a break until eleven forty. If that's correct, Gordon. And then we'll start back up. I mean, might as well stay on schedule. We'll start back up at uh, it's 11:40 East Coast time in the U.S. Uh, we'll start back up with uh, Bill Bialik. So I'll see you back in about 15 minutes. Yeah. See y'all in a few. Thank you. This is crazy.
All right. Um, everyone hear me? Yes, so. Excellent. Let's wait for everybody to repopulate for a second. All right. So welcome back uh, to the uh, to the second half of our physics of behavior virtual workshop. Um, just a quick word before we start and get uh, go to our next talk, who will be uh, Bill Bialik from Princeton University. But uh, so this will hopefully be the first of several workshops that are being uh, put up through the Emory Theory and Modeling of Living Systems Initiative. The next one will be during the week of May. Uh, of May 25th, uh, hosted by Ilya Namenman, and that will be on automated inference of uh, physical physical laws. And so that will be, uh, so stay tuned and subscribe to the Emory TMLS YouTube channel and follow on Twitter if you wanna hear more information about that or to sign up for that. So, that aside, again, thanks all for tuning back in and our, let's get right in. And our next talk will be by Bill Bialik. Uh, and he is uh, at Princeton University, where the John uh, Archibald Wheeler Battelle Professor of Physics, as well as at the uh, City University of New York Graduate Center. Um, and really, it's, it's hard to sum up all the stuff that Bill has done over the course of his career in a few words, but just say he's made really fundamental contributions to our understanding of the physics of biological systems, not only just neuro, uh, neural circuits and behavior, but also gene expression and development won all sorts of prizes, member of the National Academy of Sciences, and perhaps more importantly, a truly great mentor and really uh, someone that's driven the field and the people in it quite a ways. So Bill, take it away. Thanks, Gordon, that was very gracious. Um, can we check that I'm uh, sharing the correct screen? Yep, you're good. Okay, good, all right. Um, so uh, I wanted to respond to the provocation that, uh, that uh, Gordon and Greg gave to all of us by asking what seems like a simple question, um, which is about the dimensionality of behavior. Um, I also decided that with 10 minutes, it was better to say um, less, uh, hopefully more clearly and a little bit pedagogically. Uh, so that may mean that I tell you some things that you already know, but okay. Um, hopefully, uh, there's something new in this. Um, so uh, there's an argument that, that many people have used, uh, which goes something like this. Even if you're a big complicated organism, you don't have that many joints and you don't have that many muscles. In particular, you should remember that the number of joints and muscles is vastly less than the number of neurons, particularly in big organisms. Um, it's not vastly less if you're C. elegans, um, but certainly in us. Uh, and so there's some obvious sense in which, uh, since we don't have that many muscles and we don't have that many joints, behavior must be low dimensional because there just aren't that many things to control. And so correspondingly, you might suspect that neural activity itself would also be low dimensional. And so there's an enormous interest in, in, in searching for that low dimensionality in, in, uh, in neural activity. I'm not gonna say so much about neurons, um, but I wanna think a little bit more about this notion of behavior being low dimensional. And let me emphasize, of course, that, that in many cases, we have evidence that the dimensionality behavior is low, um, not just because there aren't that many muscles, um, but because the organism does not wander around randomly in the space of all the possibilities, uh, but rather the behavior is restricted to some lower dimensional manifold, uh, even within the limited, the, more, the limited set that is available. Um, and uh, as some of you know, I'm not unsympathetic to these arguments. Um, uh, Andre spoke um, very uh, graciously about um, the work that, that I was involved in with Greg and, and, and Will Ryu um, on C. elegans now uh, a dozen years ago. Uh, there was actually work before that um, in these beautiful experiments that Leslie Osborne had done on, on smooth pursuit eye movements in primates, where it was possible to show that entire trajectories of the response of, of the motor response of the animal to simple sensory inputs uh, filled only a very low dimensional space. And in fact, um, we could even understand why uh, those few dimensions were the, the dimensions that the animal was making use of. Um, so this idea that, that you can take what might be a complicated behavior and in, in the case of pursuit eye movements, the complexity is precisely in the trial to trial variability which is what we were able to tame by thinking about 
low, about the search for lower dimensional descriptions. The idea that you could take behavior and somehow uh, capture it in a very low dimensional space is an argument that, that um, for which I have a great deal of sympathy, but I worry. And let me give you an example of why I'm worried. And it's a little fanciful, um, but I hope you'll, you'll understand uh, that, it, I hope it helps. So um, in order to do uh, what I'm doing right now, uh, which is talking to you, uh, I make use of about a hundred muscles in my face and, and associated anatomy. Um, by contrast, uh, if you actually look at the fruit fly thorax, there are 80, about 80 muscles. And um, so what am I supposed to conclude? Am I supposed to conclude that language is a hundred dimensional behavior because, and it, that it, more precisely that it couldn't be more than a hundred dimensional behavior because there's only a hundred muscles that you use in speaking? Um, if so, then, well, I mean, I'll leave it to you to think about whether a hundred is a lot or a little. Um, if you know something about state-of-the-art models for actually processing language, you'll know that hundred dimensions is pretty low. Um, you might also wonder whether having 25% more dimensions available is enough to explain the difference between what we can do when we're speaking and what flies can do when they're walking and flying. Um, at some well, level, apology, apologies for interrupting, but your, your camera became a bit too low, so we can't see your... Ah, very good. Okay. They, perfect. Um, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Good. Uh, problem with two screens is you have to remember which one. Ah, it's the one that has the little green light. How useful. Um, so uh, at, at some level, you could say, well, uh, this argument um, is specious, uh, don't believe it, and maybe that's right. But I think what it does do is to, is to point you toward the idea that, that maybe the notion of dimensionality needs to be a bit more precise. So let me um, uh, go into professorial mode for a moment and uh, uh, talk about an example. Suppose that uh, the behavior that we, that we measure is actually just one function of time. And let's let it be a continuous variable in continuous time. So do you conclude that behavior is one dimensional? Well, um, as you know how these things go, the answer is gonna be no, but let's, let's do it in steps. Suppose it were true that you could actually write a very simple equation for the dynamics in this, of this one variable. So it just relaxes to, uh, to um, some set point, but is driven by white noise. Well, then in that case, as many of you know, what comes out is a Gaussian stochastic process with a correlation function, which is exponentially decaying in time. And if this really were a complete description of the dynamics, um, then I think we would all agree, yes, the system is one dimensional. That's all there is to it. This is in some sense, if you think about this in discrete time instead of continuous time, this is a sort of Markovian dynamics in the, continu in the continuous variable X. But suppose there were a hidden variable. So there was, a there was a Y that you weren't measuring and X and Y were coupled to each other. They're also driven by noise. Um, I think if this is the complete description of the system, then we would all say it was two dimensional even if only one of the other dimensions is observable. And interestingly, if you compute the correlation function in this system, you discover that it has two exponential decays um, with uh, rates whose I which are related to the eigenvalues of this dynamical matrix. So in a system that everybody would agree is one dimensional, you get correlation functions that have one exponential decay. In a system that everybody agrees is two dimensional, um, you get a correlation function that has two exponential decays. Well, okay, so maybe we're onto something here. So what we, want, what we really wanna do is turn it around and say, if I look at the correlation function, can I tell you, so I measure the correlation structure of behavior, can I tell you what the dimensionality of the system is? It might actually be that trying to reconstruct the dynamics is not the best thing to do. So let's think about the probability distribution for the trajectories X of T. If it's really Gaussian, then you can always write it in this form where the kernel K is the inverse of the correlation function. And the thing I wanna to do to, to, um, to get to a notion of dimensionality is to take the entire trajectory and divide it into two parts. There's the past before time equals zero and the future after time equals zero. And so of course the, the thing in the exponential can be decomposed there's terms where the past mixes with the past. There's terms where the future mixes with the future. And importantly, there is exactly one piece where the future and past mix together. And there's this thing K, which, which couples them. And um, suppose it was true that that matrix K, which couples the past and the future is a finite rank. Then everything that you can say about the future, given what you know about the past can be 
said by telling you the value of d different projections of the past. And so that's exactly like trying to write down dynamical equations for the variable x that you're observing and d minus one hidden variables. So this tells you that that thing that we were starting to see by just playing with examples, there's something deeper about it, at least for um, Gaussian stochastic processes. So you have a recipe, you estimate the correlation function, you compute this kernel, which is the crucial thing that appears in the probability distribution, which is the inverse of the correlation function. You take that kernel, you pull it apart and find the, find the component that actually couples past and future. You do a singular view that value decomposition as matrix. And what you mean by dimensionality and what corresponds to dimensionality in all those simpler problems is the number of non-zero singular values. And so this is great, but it also points to something really important, which is that if the correlations that you observe in the behavior decays slowly enough, then this dimensionality can actually grow with the size of the window that you're analyzing. And then not only is the system not low dimensional, it isn't really finite dimensional. So the, the, the message I wanna leave you with is that there is a notion of dimensionality that, that we can construct even when we're just observing a single variable. It's not about counting how many variables we observe or even counting how many variables we can observe. It's about the structure of the dynamics and the way in which correlations propagate in time. In the world of Gaussian processes, we're, we can completely understand everything. Um, so then of course, there's a bunch of uh, less elementary, more general and less well understood things to be said. Um, this notion that you can make predictions of the future by, by telling you not the entire history of the dynamics leading up to this moment, but only some finite list of projections. That's an idea that you can implement without talking about Gaussians. Um, it may or may not be exact, right? So there's a, but um, there's still a possibility there. So you can take this notion that what you mean by dimensionality is how many features of the past do I need to keep track of in order to predict the future? Um, and you can lift that away from the Gaussian, from Gaussian models. Um, if you wanna go beyond linear projections, then you need notions for smoothness for, of, of, the, of the manifolds that you're describing. If you wanna calibrate this process, see in the, in the case where things are Gaussian, you just need to do a singular value decomposition and it's not, it's not complicated. Um, but more generally, you actually need to figure out what's the total amount of information between the past and the future, um, if you wanna know whether you captured everything or not. And uh, finally, I'll make the observation that you know, when I said that things get interesting when, if correlations decay slowly enough, then of course that means that you have to be able to sample long timescales um, in the behavior. But of course there are fewer opportunities to sample long timescales than there are to sample short timescales, right? For obvious reasons. Um, and so the place, this points to the place where things get interesting, but it also points to a place where things get hard experimentally. Okay, so um, that those are my current, that's the direction of my current thinking about what dimensionality means. Um, and I'm out of time, so I'll stop. Thanks, Bill. Um, so one question that, uh, you need to move your camera back up. Yes, I was just trying to find the, Zoom again, interestingly. Uh, where did it go? Hmm. Okay, yeah, let's keep talking. All right. uh, so, so one question that's coming up is, um, oh, I stopped sharing. what sort of, there we go. Good. What sort of questions can we answer by measuring the dimensionality of behavior? What, like in the best case scenario, so let's, let's say we, we've thought this through very in depth and we have this from a one dimensional or however many dimensional measurement, what really is the, what would be sort of the desired outcome or the goal for having that? Um, okay, so, uh, I mean, this is another version of the, of the what, is it, what is it you wanted to know question, which, which mm -hmm. comes up in every case. Um, I think that um, another reason that I get nervous about the search for low dimensional descriptions is that in many cases, I can't tell, and, and I'll engage in self-criticism here as well. I can't tell whether I'm looking for a low dimensional representation because paper is two dimensional or because I, there's some fundamental reason why it should be low dimensional. So if, there's, if I actually have a theory that tells me it should be low dimensional for this reason, 
then I think the search for a low dimensional representation is incredibly well motivated. And, and you have to do it in a way to test that theory. That's one of the reasons why I liked the thing we were able to do um, in the case of, of pursuit eye movements. Um, on the other hand, it is true the paper is two dimensional and, and we're limited in various ways. So having low dimensional descriptions is attractive to lots of people. I think for that reason, it's simpler. What I worry about and what was, what was motivating this discussion is that that we sort of build up this, this feeling that it ought to be low dimensional because it would be easier for us. And we conflate good reasons. We start coming up with various, we, we list a whole bunch of things that are related to the possibility of things being low dimensional. We kind of mash them all together. And in the end, we think, oh, it all must be low dimensional. But how do you then, how do you measure the dimensionality in a way that isn't, isn't sort of circular with all the other things? So it's more about test, I, I view it first and foremost, about either testing very specific theories of why it should be low dimensional or why it should be high dimensional. I mean, you might, you might have reasons for that too, or um, uh, sort of testing our intuition and trying to be more objective about testing that intuition. All right. So we have a, um, so we have some more questions here from, uh, from the YouTube channel. So, in, uh, so, uh, Sarah Soya has asked, uh, so if the eigenvalues of the past to future uh, kernel uh, decay exponentially, there is also a finite dimension. So would we expect there to see a power law decay? Uh, sorry, Sarah, let me, uh, so certainly if you have a Gaussian stochastic process and the, and the correlation function decays as a power law, that is, the, that is one of the cases in which you will not see uh, sort of finite dimensionality in the sense that I defined it. Um, as long as the correlation function is composed out of a finite number of exponentials, then, so I was leading you down the path with the finite number of exponentials. Then I said, okay, wait, let's do it a different way. Those two ways are really the same. Um, and in fact, you can compute all of everything uh, explicitly in the case where the correlation functions are finite, um, are a finite set of exponentials. Um, I guess part of the emphasis was to say that going through an explicit dynamical model, um, is actually a little bit weird because since if it's true that you can only observe one variable out of the D, then the exact form of that model is degenerate, right? So, um, so you want to stay, you know, you might want to stay away from that and work directly with the distribution over trajectories. Uh, any any comments from the panel? I had a comment. Um, I, I, first of all, just to, just to say thanks for making that um, explicit because something I sometimes run up against when we're measuring lots of things is I thought it was four dimensional. You know, isn't it just four behaviors or something like that? The implication that the space of postures is say four dimensional implies somehow that the, the space we care about when we're thinking about behavior is also four dimensional, which is by the way, not I, the case, I would intuitively add, not the case. I would add, however, that Greg and his colleagues have had remarkable success in, in writing down dynamical equations in relatively low dimensional spaces. Um, so maybe it is, maybe, maybe the worm really is low dimensional, but um, I also worry about, and, and I guess this is, you showed some of this, right? That we don't have that much access to structures on very long time scales. In particular, in, if you have, you have to worry about non-stationarities over the long time scales. And so, sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 no that's, that's, that's fine, yeah. Um, it, it, well, the only other thing was maybe just to, um, to Gordon's question, I think one kind of usefulness of having a better idea of the dimensionality, if we really believed it, um, it would help us probably in, in trying to get to better descriptions and answer that sort of question I raised of the, the difference between an effective description and a, and a principled one, um, because we measure a lot of uh, things. Uh, you know, once we slice and dice them, we're getting up to thousands of different numbers we're measuring. We don't truly believe it's a thousand dimensional. Um, but where is it? Um, right. I think having a good answer for that actually would be very helpful for us in sort of constraining our search for other descriptions. Uh, okay, um, and so and that, so sort of dovetailing in on that, there's been a bunch of people that would uh, be interested in asking about like, what are your thoughts as to how we would actually suss out in the future, what sort of experiments or what sort of analysis methods would we actually need to be able to suss out long time scale structure and behavior? So I think there's a, I think there's a tendency, um, and Gordon, I think you, you ran into this. Um, when you see long time scales, 
I think most people think toward non-stationarities. So if you watch an animal for a long time, I don't know, he gets hungry, he gets bored, he gets familiar with his environment. He get... And so there's some small number of variables that you think about that um, are essentially changing in a secular fashion across the long period of your, uh, of your experiment. So I think there's a question about, um, is there a regime in which you, have you, ha you can do a long experiment and have things be statistically stationary? And you know, what are the limits on that? And I think that in order, in order to get at the questions that, that I outlined here, we're gonna have to address that much more explicitly. I mean, usually what we do is there's something we compute and then we ask whether that thing was stationary. But here I wanna know, can I trust the correlations in behavior that I see across the minute time scale, across the 10 minute time scale, across the 100 minute time scale? And you know, there's gonna be a limit. Um, but actually, if it were really true that, that you had, um, you know, if you, it, you know, if you think about going from, uh, you know, seconds, you know, seconds to hours is already three orders of magnitude, right? So um, if you could span, you know, could, can you do an hour which is stationary? That seems plausible, but you know that there are things happening on the second time scale. So you have three decades. So do we really understand correlations across three decades? Is it that there's one thing happening on one time scale and another thing happening on another time scale? Or is there a kind of continuum which would generate the high dimensional, the signs of high dimensionality that I was pointing to? Can, can uh, well, I just add, put it, put in a plug that for Andre has 10 hour recordings of C. elegans at 30 Hertz. And we'll have a version of an answer in the case of C. elegans for this question, which I think was going to be really interesting. So how do you span these at least three or four orders of magnitude? Let's also say that 10 hours for C. elegans is definitely not stationary. You're talking, you're getting into aging timescales for C. elegans when you're talking 10 hours. <laughs> right. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, yeah, with that, uh, is also special, right? So you might want to be one. One needs to be careful. <laughs> right. Well, with that, uh, thank Bill again, and I guess we'll move on to our next speaker. Uh, this is going to be Alexander Mathis, who's coming to us from uh, presumably, I'm guessing, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, he where he's currently a, a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, 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 Chan Zuckerberg, postdoctoral fellow at Harvard, uh, and he'll soon be a group leader at EPF in uh, the Sun. And really, sort of what I've always liked about his work is that he does nice work using nice mathematical modeling combined with ver with advanced computer science and machine learning techniques to really trying to get at biological problems. And of course, as many people watching this today know, he's also one of the reasons why we're in this mess to begin with, being one of the co-developers of Deep Lab Cut. So, uh, with that. Alex, take it away. Thank you for the kind introduction. And it's it, it has really been exciting to be part of this. So let me turn on my slides. I think everyone sees this. Um, so in my talk, I so, so I think it's wonderful following up Bill Bialek because he really has highlighted the importance of of kind of kind of having long time scale measurements of behavior and having maybe data across labs, and I think um, there's some general problems that we have in order to get there. And I will focus mostly on pose estimation, but just as a kind of a crutch to get at these problems and highlight. And because I believe that kind of the solutions or kind of aspects that I outline for pose estimation are also general to, for example, make robust generalizable action recognition or behavioral analysis methods that go beyond, let's say, the lab, uh, the scale of a single lab. So um, let me start by reminding everyone of the obvious fact that there's obviously a extraordinary diversity of different animals. And even if you focus on one specific animal, like the cheetah, who's known as the fastest land mammal and is an elegant runner, as you can see in this video, Cheetahs also, of course, engaged in lots of different behaviors like fight, flight, uh, hunting, and so on. 
And what we really seek in order to understand behavior and build this physics of behavior is to create methods that allow us to quantify behavior. And uh, this is challenging, you know, and we, we need to have ways to compress this high diversity of data. And I think what is, what is clear now that one way, at least if we focus mostly on video data is to use computer vision tools and computer vision tools can, can really compress behavior in the following ways. We can get at the shape of animals, we can get at the texture, and we can, for example, even do texture synthesis to do real-time single shot tracking of animals in complex behind, uh, backgrounds. And another way, of course, is um, especially for mammals that have skeletons, we can use pose estimation to summarize with low dimensional descriptions um, the state of their bodies. And I think, and that is in some sense, obviously the promise of this workshop, um, the premise of this workshop, we have really gotten far based on, on the advances in deep learning. And for example, what we can do is we can uh, take train deep neural networks to really in the wild in South Africa do um, 3D reconstructions of cheetahs running. And this is of course just one example and these methods obviously work beyond cats. They work extremely generally um, and in, to do 2D pose estimation, to do 3D pose estimation, to even do dense full body reconstruction. Uh, and, and that has been achieved both for animals and for humans. So we really have these exciting measurement tools. And I think these exciting measurement tools has, have also given us many, many exciting applications, both in neuroscience, ethology, and in medicine and so on, of course, um, as we highlighted in our recent review. But I think, um, so there, there are some examples here of, from physiotherapy, pellet reaching, pupillometry, and so on and so forth. And I think if we, if we step back for a second, then I think what has been achieved is really that um, within a given lab, within a given experiment, it's relatively easy now to collect high quality, high fidelity data of poses of different animals. And people can really ask, answer questions that they have in, in much easier ways and scale up the ends without, with less manual work, um, which is, I think, really amazing. But what, what is, I think, a challenge is essentially that although maybe this, these networks, I mean, we know that they can be made uh, generalizable across different individuals, they might even generalize within a lab, and it's then harder to make them generalize across different labs even harder, of course, to generalize across different animal groups or across different mammals, for example. How can we get analysis methods that would scale across all the different mammals? And the challenge here is, of course, that the larger the scale, the greater the diversity, so the greater, the harder it will be to create methods that universally work. And what I mean here is not that everyone would have to retrain on their specific data set. And of course, there are, there are two kind of canonical ways to address this. One way would be that uh, we standardize experiments across labs and have similar systems. And there are many groups that do this. And I think this is an extremely powerful and, and important approach. But another method is, of course, that we actually try to create machine learning methods to generalize broadly across this diversity. And just to highlight really the challenges behind why it is actually not trivial maybe to generalize across different background statistics and different behaviors and so on. I think there's essentially the two fundamental reasons. The same behavior of a given uh, subject can look extremely different in different labs. And I want to highlight this with uh, this, this video here where you see Where you saw that um, all these different humans is actually synthesized data are performing the same actions, but um, it looks extremely diverse. And that is obviously a problem to make an algorithm that is generalizable. And similarly, we can have a case where um, actually this, this, the image statistics are extremely similar, but people are the person, the subject does something very different. And then that is, of course, also a challenge um, for the algorithms because it really needs to be able to to cluster this in the correct way. And in fact, we, we could argue you know, that machine learning um, can do that, of course, no? I mean, we can do reliable pose estimation on these cases. 
But what we really need to do in order to scale this up to all this diversity is there. So I should back up. So I think there are fundamentally two ways to make generalizable pose estimation networks. One is we scale up the data sets and, and the human machine learning field has given us an example for this. So here, for example, these are different um, examples in the, in the, co in the NPI pose data sets with it has 26,000 images, 40,000 humans performing different actions and they're all annotated. And then if you train a network on this data set, then it actually generalizes very well to, um, to different scenarios as this PI here in the bar in Cambridge before the lockdown, obviously. And um, so this is a way to make generalizable methods. And one could do the same, of course, for animals, but we're not there yet. And I think this is something that is, would be really interesting for us to do. And as a case study, we have started to create um, this benchmark with lots of different horses. Horses are a great example because you can really highlight the diversity and how they appear differently and how it actually is a challenge to have algorithms to generalize from a set of different horses to other horses. And this is actually a data set that we created that has 8,000 images where we have 30 different horses and different backgrounds with different walkers. And, um, and with this data set, I wanna highlight another way to actually make generalizable methods, which is that, um, that more powerful neural network architecture. So what you see here on this plot is on the x-axis is more powerful neural networks and on the y-axis it's higher performance. So firstly, the more powerful the neural network is, the better it is actually on the training data and on the test data. That's expected and nice. Um, but what is also the case is that we find that it even generalizes better to other novel unseen horses. Okay. And so this is another way to make robust generalizable methods. Um, okay. So. And, and then these, these networks might really generalize well out of the box to, for example, your example of a different horse, this brown horse down there. So this network was only trained on this um, chestnut horse and it generalizes well to this brown horse. But if you have very different scene statistics, then what you could do is you could just annotate a few more frames and then briefly retrain the network and it will generalize to your situation that is clearly very different. And so with this vision, this goes along the idea of creating kind of a model zoo where people could really share, um, share data and annotate data in similar ways. And I think this would be really powerful for us so that we can get actually standardized measurements across different systems where people can do this in a plug and play way where they don't have to train their own networks. And that would help us to go towards Bill Bielik's question of what is the dimensionality of behavior because we would have from many, many different labs comparable measures. And before I close, I also want to highlight one additional aspect and that I think is a, is a major challenge for understanding behavior that is of course, the field as such, you know, we're pushing to make more reliable measures. But even if we have um, complete measures, then it's not trivial to in fact find out what is happening behind this. And I want to highlight this by, by kind of showing this example of Conway's Game of Life, which probably most people are familiar with, where actually relatively simple rules are put down and then the dynamics of this can be observed. And we know that um, it is very hard to infer the rules of this game just by observing, even if you can measure everything. So with that, I want to conclude. I want to um, I wanted to highlight that behavior is highly diverse. And in the, even though we can now track a lot, we cannot do so universally. And I think what we could do to get to there is really to create large scale benchmarks, to create um, data sets of diverse data so that we really have um, have kind of networks to generalize out of the box relatively well. And that has the advantage to have consistency and comparable. And of course, it would also be more scalable. And with this, I also want to acknowledge um, all the people that work with me on Deep Lab Cut and many of our collaborators. And I'm happy to take your questions. Thanks, Alex. Um, so one question I had 
was like, so you have, if you have this network that's able to train in this really general way. And so certainly part of the computations it's doing or something at least sort of from a, maybe a more physics -y standpoint might be a little bit boring, like imposing uh, translational and rotational types of symmetries on the problem. But do you think that there, are, what could, what do you think we could learn about from actually trying to tear open the guts of the network that's been that's been trained that can generalize in all these different things? Can we learn something about behavior that way? Um, I would say no. Um, I mean, <laughs> obviously these neural networks are extremely interesting for how they reach decisions, how they, um, how they achieve tasks. But specifically, I think here, I would really see this purely as a tool. And, and I kind of wanted to highlight that we know already two avenues to rely, to reasonably make generalizable networks. One is we just pool data and create bigger data sets, or we make more powerful architectures. Um, but I think the real promise of this is that we, that we have kind of reliable, robust measurements that are shareable between us. And, and then going forward, it would be something more like what has been done in the warm world, where you can really have from many labs, very similar conditions and data. And that, I think, is really powerful for understanding behavior. Namely, having someone had this comment that what would we get from having all these databases? I think we actually want the databases because if we have the databases, we can easily test hypotheses, build models, come up with better experiments. That's really what we want in my mind. So a, que a question coming in from, um from the YouTube comments uh, is, this is coming from uh, Antonio from Greg's group, um, asking about how can we uh, decide how many points to track in an animal? And does this relate to uh, Bill's questions about the dimensionality of behavior? Well, okay, so, so that really depends on your question, no? Like if you want to say, what's the, if you want to answer the question, what's the dimensionality of behavior, then you should probably track everything you can. And even then it's probably most likely just a lower bound on what the answer actually is. And that's the nature of the problem. But if your question is, is maybe, for example, what the role of a, whether a particular drug changes behavior, then maybe scent of mass tracking is actually sufficient to answer that question. And maybe some more key points are sufficient to answer the question. So in my mind, really, this is, um, there's no, it really depends on the question. Um, but of course, you should talk to ethologists and biologists that, because I mean, there's some good key points that it makes sense for a given animal. Um, are there are there any comments from the or questions from the panel? Um, so one one question coming from uh, Jeff Markowitz uh, is asking why is having a generalizable posed network necessary? Would it be a problem necessarily if we use different networks for different subjects or people? And so what really are the advantages to having like this one big Uber network? Um, I, I mean, no, it's not a necessity. No, in some sense, you can everyone can train their own network. Everyone can burn some CO2, that's one aspect. But of course, if we can just share the networks and make them more robust, then I think it really has the promise to be easier comparable analysis after the fact. And for example, people don't need to train and it will just, yeah, I think it's just easier and reprodu increases reproducibility. I think it's also important not to underestimate the importance of making things easy to use. Um, I think if we want these sorts of approaches to diffuse more broadly, it's very important that the barrier to entry is low for new people. And not everyone is going to say, I want to track all of these joints sufficiently to train my own network. They might not even have those skills. And so um, I think it's a lot of work to make things usable, um, but I think it's also very important. And another point, okay. that, sorry, maybe that actually inference is very cheap and you can have a cheap, a small GPU to do inference. But training needs much bigger GPUs so in practice also. Um, if every lab trains, it's always 12 hours, or it depends on exactly how large the data set is and so on. But so we, that's just an advantage in my mind. 
So, so I had one question, Gordon, if I could jump in, and that is, you know, why are we focused on putting points on images, right? When what we what we want is dynamics of behavior, which might just be yet another sort of auto encoded or otherwise uh, sort of computational process on the image stream. What do you think about that? Um, no, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, it's I mean, as I also tried to highlight in my second slide, obviously there are different methods now, and I think Sam Ryder's work, for example, is a great example that texture is super important for as a kind of low dimensional description of what some animals are doing. And I think, again, this is a case where it really depends on what your question is and what you want to do. Um, I think what I personally, for example, like about key points is um, for many, for some animals, no, but not for all, it, it's very intuitive that they give a reasonable low dimensional projection of what is happening. Whereas if you, for example, let's say crop out an animal and do PCA on the stack of images, I don't really know what these components actually mean. Okay, all right, well, great. Uh, is there anything, any other questions from the, all right. Well, thanks again, Alex. Uh, and now we'll move on to our, our penultimate talk. Uh, with, uh, and that'll be Ann Kennedy uh, from uh, Caltech, where she's a postdoctoral researcher uh, working with David Anderson. Uh, and Ann's done all sorts of really interesting work at the interface of computational neuroscience, math modeling, and doing some very nice computer vision uh, methods to actually try and say something about uh, uh, behavior and really trying to understand what it means to represent behavior in a lot of interesting ways. Uh, and in particular, trying to do that in service of understanding the nature and the neurobiology of social behavior. So no further ado, Ann. Okay, thank you, Gordon, for that introduction. Let me, uh, screen is shared. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yes, thank you guys for including me in this workshop. It's um, been really interesting so far listening to the talks. I'm going to come at this from a sort of different perspective, uh, more driven from the neuroscience goal of understanding how the brain shapes behavior and what we've done towards that goal and what um, pose estimation and tracking and automated behavior de detection has done for that goal. Um, so ultimately, my goal as a neuroscientist is to understand what's going on in the brains of animals as they're interacting with the world which you can kind of break down into there's a sensory processing step, you perform some sort of action selection based on your sensory environment, and then you execute a behavior. And what makes animals different from sort of input output robots is the fact that this action selection stage in the middle is very, can be very nuanced and can have very, can be informed by information on very long time scales. So things like the memories of animals, their past experience, how stressed out or hungry or afraid they are, can change the way that they respond to the same stimulus. And so when we're thinking about this, this set of problems, there's kind of two flavors of questions that I'm interested in in my research. The first is understanding the control policies for action selection themselves, independent of what the brain is doing. Can we understand how animals make decisions about what behaviors to perform and how the animal's internal state informs those decisions? Um, and then there's the second question of how the brain is implementing those control policies. And the first of these questions is driven just by looking at behavior itself, the second by relating behavior to neural activity in different brain regions. And so as a postdoc, I've been working in the Anderson lab at Caltech where they've been studying neural representations of social behaviors in nuclei of the hypothalamus. Uh, so a typical experiment in the Anderson lab looks kind of like this. You take a mouse and you attach a head mounted microendoscope to image the activity of neurons within some brain area of interest. Uh, for us, it's usually the hypothalamus. Then we let the animal freely interact with a male or female conspecific. We look at what the brain is doing. We look at the video of the behavior, and then we try to put the two together. And so if you go to the very raw data, it looks kind of like this. You've got mice running around, freely interacting with each other in a resident intruder assay. Uh, the resident is the mouse with the scope on its head. And then on the right here, you're seeing a, the field of view from the scope showing the activity of neurons expressing the sclerosis calcium indicator. So cells responding to the social interactions. 
So when we start with these experiments, we have raw video data and we have calcium imaging data. And for both of these data sets, we have kind of two stages of processing. There's first the data extraction stage, and then there's the data analysis stage. And what this workshop has really been fueled by is the emergence of methods for extracting data from raw video in a way that wasn't possible before. For neural imaging data for about a five, 10 years now, we've had pretty set methods for how we're going to figure out what cells in the brain are doing. Uh, now that we can do the same thing with video, video, we're kind of at this point where we have the starting point for doing science. And now the question is, how do we go from this data extraction stage to making sense of what's going on in the brain and what's going on in the behavior? And there's a couple different approaches you can take to making sense of the behavior. You can look at continuous varying features of animals' poses, say the velocity of an animal, its orientation to another animal. You can try to detect previously defined behaviors of interest, like attack or sniffing or mating. And you can use unsupervised methods to try to study behavior from straight from either the, the extracted pose or some transformation of that pose. Uh, a lot of the talks today have been sort of driven by this principle of discovering behaviors in an unsupervised way. What I'd like to talk about today is this approach of what we can do if we take some user-defined behaviors and we use that as a starting point to try to make sense of what, what's going on in these videos. So after you've finished the data extraction phase, uh, you'll get something that looks kind of like this. So this is a raster of cells in one particular nucleus of hypothalamus, and you're seeing the color here is indicating how active the cells are. And these are two mice that have been tracked using the Anderson Labs uh, pose estimation system of MARS, the Mouse Action Recognition System. And you can see that there's lots of changes going on in the pose as the animals are freely interacting. And that at the same time, there are changes in how cells are responding during this period of social interaction. So it's really a rich data set and there's a lot of ways we could go from here. Uh, as a starting point, we decided to go with what, and what you can determine just by taking human defined behaviors that have previously been found to be interesting for various reasons. So what if we take the video and just frame by frame annotate it for different behaviors of interest? This is enough information to already learn interesting things about the brain. So this is just a sample of a work in progress with Tomomi Cargo, where we took manually defined behaviors for uh, various, for female directed and male directed interactions. And we clustered neurons based on their responses during these behaviors. And you can start to see neurons that have preferences for different behaviors of interest. And also you can begin to see differences in how behavior is represented in different brain regions. So these human-defined behaviors are telling us something. There's some information there about, um, about, what, about the neural activity. We can also use manually defined behaviors as a starting point for understanding the effect of perturbations to an animal. So working with Moriel Zelikowski, we took mice that had undergone three different types of perturbations. We either, Moriel either socially isolated mice gave them mating sexual experience or gave them a single traumatic shock, and then looked at their interactions with a male conspecific during a 10 minute resident intruder assay like you just saw. And in all three of these groups, she saw that there was increased aggression in these groups compared to unmated group housed control mice. Uh, so that was a starting point. Manual defined behaviors were showing this uh, effect of these perturbations on animals actions. We can start to go a little bit further by taking features extracted from the estimated poses of these mice and looking at how those features evolve over time. So take a window of time relative to the start of a sniff bout and look at how different features of the animal's postures are evolving over as a function of time. We can just take that snippet of time for a set of about 30 features that we handcraft embed them into a low dimensional space and get some embedding of the dynamics of behavior for all sniff bouts across animals. We can then separate those sniff bouts out by group and we can see that different groups of animals show some kinds of sniffing more than they show others. Uh, we can then go in and look at the individual features that are defining those, those types of sniffing and we can identify differences between them and show that some groups of animals are enriched for certain types of sniffing and uh, less enriched for others. And with that, just clustering of sniff bouts by the, by the values of these extracted features, we can decode which group the animal is in with fairly high accuracy. 
Uh, so this is all based on, I, I kind of skipped over it, but the mouse action recognition system is a tool in our lab for a uh, pose estimation and behavior classification that tries to go from the data extraction step of pose estimation to identifying features of pose and then detecting behaviors. Uh, it's a different architecture from deep lab cut, but you could consider it pretty comparable. It detects mice and extracts their poses. And then we have handcrafted features from those poses that we use to detect behaviors. So we want to talk now a little bit about this uh, decision to rely on human defined behaviors and how much we can learn from that. Um, there's actually a couple points in this pipeline where we're relying on humans to define what's relevant here. The first is when we do pose estimation, we manual, we picked the set of key points that we wanted our pose estimator to extract from the animal and use that to represent what it's doing. We then picked these handcrafted features extracted from the pose that are things that seem like they could be important, like whether the animals are close together, whether they're facing each other, how fast they're moving. And then we're trying to classify these uh, human defined behaviors that were identified as relevant, things like aggression and sniffing that we, we want to know how the brain controls. Uh, so I wanted to get into the question of what we're doing when we're using these human imposed uh, constraints on this process. Uh, so the first uh, step of human interpretation of this data is pose estimation. And when Mars was trained, we took raw frames and we had them annotated by six individuals on Amazon Mechanical Turk and then defined our ground truth key point location as the median of those, those six individuals. And in general, people are pretty good at this task. Uh, these are sort of the ground truth median key points with one sigma ellipses around them. So you can see that humans agree pretty consistently on where body parts are. Uh, here you can see that a lot of the human estimated key points fall within a centimeter of ground truth, which is about a little bit bigger than the mouse's ear. And Mars is able to do about as well as humans. So this is the accuracy of the Mars post estimator compared to the best versus the worst human annotators. And you can see that we're doing around as well. We do about as well as the humans do. And the humans are a good constraint for how Mars is performing. Um, this and in overall around, yeah, over 90% of key points are within a half a centimeter radius of ground truth. So for the pose estimation problem, that good, looks good. Now, if we go to the problem of classifying actions, uh, we started with a set of behaviors that we already cared about in lab, like sniffing and attack and mating. And we decided we wanted to look at how reliable humans are for scoring these behaviors and think about whether these are behaviors that make sense to study. So attack, mount, and sniff, we had six people in the Anderson lab score a set of 10 videos, 10 minutes each for these behaviors. And in a lot of cases, it looks pretty good. There's good human consensus among these six annotators for when sniffing bouts are occurring and when mounting bouts are occurring. In other cases, it doesn't look so great. So if you have the six people all in the same lab scoring videos for bouts of sniffing and attack and male-male interactions, you can get a lot of different opinions on when the actual attack is happening and when sniffing is happening, uh, which is, this is like an especially bad example from a video that was particularly challenging to annotate, but it shows us that there's something tricky about these human defined behaviors where we're losing some, where we're, different people are using different internal models to annotate, even if they're trained in the same lab and given the same instructions. Uh, the good news about this is, so here's a summary of the human data showing precision and recall of each annotator compared to one of the lab mates, lab mate B. You can see that you're getting maybe around 80, 90 percent. Um, here's definitions of precision and recall. Mars is able to capture a particular training annotator, lab may be, with a, about as well or maybe a little bit better than other annotators. So this is saying if you want to detect behaviors of interest, you're going to be more accurate if you train a classifier to detect those behaviors than if you rely on somebody else in your lab to do the annotations for you. So with Mars, we can use these. Uh, these uh, behavior classifiers to identify differences between mouse lines. This is just showing that Mars's classifiers can detect uh, significant increases in aggression and changes in sniffing behavior across mice. Uh, so 
it's useful for something, but there is this subjectivity. And I think this is something that is worth thinking about further. Uh, if you look at the individual human annotators, um, back on the slide, back here, um, it's not that the differences between annotators are just total noise of people making random guesses about when behaviors happen, but people seem to be internally consistent. Some people are always lumpers and some people are more strict in what they count to behavior. And if you take all of the annotations for a specific behavior of interest, in this case, sniffing, and align them to the median of the group and when that indicates the start of sniffing, you can see biases where some annotators always start a little bit later than others, some always start a little bit earlier, and then within an annotator, within an annotator those are also some degree of scatter in when they annotate votes. So I think that going forward, in addition to looking at pose and extracting out features from pose, there's something to be learned about behaviors that humans have defined in the past. And just by uh, clustering, just by looking at the differences in how humans score behaviors, there's some indication that there's more information in the video present that's being used by people when they create their own rules. And I think going forward, uh, their own uh, annotation system. So going forward, one question I'm really interested in is figuring out what rules different individuals are using to score behaviors and whether we can use the rules different individuals use to learn more about behavior without relying on an unsupervised method. And sorry, I was going to do a demo, but in the interest of time, I'll go to my conclusion slide. Um, we have these different ways of extracting information about behavior that can be used either fully unsupervised, continuously valued, discrete valued signals. And uh, a question I kind of want to pose for discussion is we've heard a lot about the unsupervised approach. And what's unclear to me is how much it matters whether the unsupervised approach is capturing the behaviors that a human would identify when they score things, and what can be learned by looking at human-defined behaviors alongside uh, unsupervised defined uh, behaviors discovered via unsupervised uh, behavior discovery methods. So with that, I'd like to thank the members of the Anderson Lab and my collaborators, especially Tomomi Kariko for the imaging data and Moriel Zelikowski at Utah for the, the PTSD data set, and I'll take questions. Thanks, Anne. Uh, this is great. Uh, any, do we have any questions from the from the panel? Um, I have a question. Um, so great talk, first of all. Um, I was thinking, so in, in my field, we often deal with vocalizations. And um, one of the things we also note that people sometimes differ in how they label different vocalizations. But part of the reason for that in, in this case is that some of the vocalizations are actually kind of hybrid states, hybrid vocalizations between two types. And so I guess I was wondering in your, both in your work, but also just more generally, um, do you think, how much do you think this sort of possibility that these states are not as discrete as we would like them to be plays into this? And maybe this is just a general question for the whole panel, sort of, can, can we address this question about how discrete behaviors or discrete or continuous behaviors really are in, in some sense of really are um, with these methods? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And I think that I think that these labels of sniffing and attack, I'm one of these lab mates here is me. And when I went in and scored these videos, it was really tough sometimes to make the call of like, they're sniffing, but they have an intention to attack, but they haven't quite started attack yet. So do you call that one or the other? There's a lot of mental modeling of the mouse's supposed thought process that goes into scoring a video like this and different people come up with their own rules for how that model translates to a set of labels. Um, and I think that really these, what this is showing is that these labels may be sufficient for some definitions of behavior, like for mounting, everybody kind of agrees on what mounting is, but for other things like attack and aggressive investigation, there seems to be from this analysis and clear evidence that these labels aren't really sufficient for describing behavior. Whether that just means we need to add a couple more categories or whether you need to go to a different representation entirely, something continuous is uh, yeah, still to be determined. Um, so there, there's a question uh, on the YouTube channel from uh, Kyle Naughton, which I think was meant partially as a joke, but I think there's some serious new to it. The question was, is there such thing as an Eigen lab mate? 
<laughs> basically the no and I think I, I think there is something quite serious with that which is the yeah. notion and you mentioned this thinking about the variability of labeling and is there I guess maybe to add my own two cents on top of that is there something that that teaches us about the information that might be there in the video by picking up on say the covariant structure between different individuals that are looking at it yeah, I think that is something I'd love to do. So I should add uh, thanks to these six lab mates. This has been one of our lab's quarantine projects is just getting people to sit down and score these things. So I'm really excited to go into these data sets in the future and see, are there categories of how people score things? Is it kind of continuous? How can we distinguish just noise and changes in how attentive a person is in scoring behavior versus actual stylistic differences? There are definitely, at a first glance, lumpers and splitters, like people who really like slide frame by frame are very careful in how they mark the start and stop of behaviors versus people who will look at a bout where there's aggressive, aggressive intent and therefore score that whole bout as aggression. But yeah, it's not clear whether there are categories or a continuum. So I had a question uh, kind of related, which is, again, trying to hone in on what the human labelers are looking at. Does it make yeah. sense to think about designing, a, you know, a realistic looking and yet artificial mouse so, so that you encode the rules, right? Mm -hmm. And you can have them continuous and you can have them discrete and you can see, are there people that pay attention to the slope of some variable, a threshold? I'm just wondering, that probably takes you in a different direction, but I'm wondering if that's ever come up. Yeah, uh, we haven't tried the artificial mouse approach, although I think um, Josh Merrill's done some work on this uh, ethology in a simulated organism. I think Bob Dada's lab has as well. But yeah, one thing that we're looking into now is whether instead of having people score a video frame by frame, if we can have different people write, uh, this is with Yi Song Yu at Caltech, write what are called labeling functions. So write a short program that defines their rules for categorizing behavior, like the acceleration has to be above X and the velocity and the proximity has to be below Y. Uh, those labeling functions seem to get us pretty close to human uh, frame by frame annotation standards, maybe like 90% of the way there. So that is one thing that we could look at is if we collect a bunch of these labeling functions, are there patterns that emerge there and how people define behaviors or could we infer a labeling function given how different people score things. Would it would it make sense to take um, across to the ensemble of people who labeled the video um, sort of event markers where they say, okay, something happened now mm -hmm. and and say, look, we, we don't expect everybody to agree, but the the idea that something happened at this moment yeah. seems reasonable. And so then you take all you take you focus on on those uh, you know sort of short snippets that surround that and try and do some unsupervised clustering or you know correlations between them. And you know, maybe it turns out that you know everybody's picking up on something, but you know, you gave them words. Mm -hmm. And they're mapping to the words as you know that there's an element of arbitrariness there, but, yeah. but you could um, you could somehow find the the, the set of things mm -hmm. uh, because it does. I mean, transitions are rare, so it does focus your your analysis problem mm -hmm. right? rather than rather than trying to cluster behaviors. Um, you could think about trying to cluster the the trajectories around that surround the transitions. Yeah. So we could do say change point detection and instead of looking frame by frame, look at like event by event and see if people's decisions for starting and stopping annotation line up with those event transitions. Right, I, I mean, like, really cool. like in the example that you showed where, you know, you looked at how people distributed relative to median. Yeah. I mean, if it's really, it, I mean, actually that's kind of, a, and it, might, it might be encouraging, I'm not sure, right? So, I think it is, so the question yeah. is if you, if you slid, if everybody, if you slid all those events around, mm -hmm. You know, do they really do they really look alike once they're once they're properly aligned? So they've all picked out the same transition. They're just yeah. there's disagreement about what to call the transition because after mm -hmm. all, there, there's nothing about your instructions to them that tells that creates a right answer for that, right? That's that specific, yeah. In this case, it's like how close the two nose the nose of the resident has to be to the intruder before they label it as the start of sniffing. Like, is it here or is it here? So it's like the same. But for example, if I looked at the at the trajectory of that distance, mm -hmm. 
um, in all of these examples. If I do a little sliding, do they all do they all line up? So they, everybody mm -hmm. really is picking up on some stereotyped event? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I haven't looked at that to see. I think if you look at, oh, here I can pull up. I mean, it's hard to um, do it with, the, with the whole movie, but. Yeah. You see that people kind of tend to agree in when they, certain people agree on when certain behaviors start pretty consistently. Uh, these two annotators are pretty similar in how they score sniffing. So it might be that they all have just time shifted versions of the same event taking place. I, I don't know if that's what you had in mind. Yeah. This isn't the best. yeah, and so that maybe you could fetch out what that, you know, you could get a more quantitative and objective description of that event mm -hmm. using the, the hand labels as a, as a starting point. Yeah. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to compare uh, pose and trajectory based discretization versus hand label based discretization um, in the future. I think one thing that's necessary for that is that at some point we can't make these poor people annotate all of these videos. So can we capture the annotation style of different individuals and then from our approximation of their styles, can we figure out what rules they're using and do things like detecting these events? Great. Well, thanks, Anne. I think uh, there's a lot of great questions going on I'm seeing, but unfortunately, I think we're going to have to move on to our, uh, our very last speaker. Uh, who is Nick Willett, uh, who is a associate professor at Stanford in civil and environmental engineering. I've been lucky enough to know Nick for well, longer than probably I care to admit. Uh, uh, we were grad students together way back in the day. And really, so he, he, he comes back, he, he, he comes from, uh, he did some brilliant work initially starting and still doing, really trying to understand the nature of turbulent flow use, using combining very careful experiments with careful computer vision to understand how to track particles in this complicated environment. And so a natural transition is, well, I'm tracking particles in a complex environment. This is, this is what we're doing in behavior also. And so he's gonna tell presumably about collective behavior in midges and other cool animals. So take it away. Thanks, Gordon. Um, quick check over Zoom. Everyone can see the proper one of my screens and can hear me. Okay, so um, thanks to, to uh, Gordon and Greg for organizing this. I think this has gone surprisingly well. Uh, so, you know, science in the era of coronavirus. And thanks to everyone else, um, my, my co-panelists here. Um, I feel a little bit like I really am bringing up the rear in that much of what I'm gonna talk about has already been teased out or, or, or mentioned in various aspects. So uh, forgive me for repeating, but um, just to see it that I, you've all been asking great questions. I'm gonna just try to stress those. So my title here, uh, Wither Collective Behavior, um, Gordon just mentioned that sort of you know, historically and still to a large degree, a lot of the work that I do is in hydrodynamic turbulence. Um, my title is in fact intended to, why are we not going, directly draw a parallel there to a meeting that happened actually at Cornell a little more than 30 years ago um, in turbulence that was entitled Wither Turbulence, Turbulence at the Crossroads, where the idea was to bring together people who were working in the field um, as there was a sense that some aspects of the, the technical nitty gritties of how you do stuff was maturing. So um, experimental approaches were becoming mature, computation was getting to the point where you could do realistic simulations, um, which was exposing many of the same tensions that I think we see in the field of, of behavior and particularly in collective behavior, which is what I know best. Um, in particular, this tension between what do you see, how do you visualize, what is apparent by, by taking a human perspective and looking at a complicated turbulent flow with the naked eye, and how do you marry that to the predictions or, or even fundamentals behind a, a purely statistical approach? How do you put those two things together? Um, so I, I was just struck in thinking about, Gordon and Greg asked me to be uh, provocative and think about the future, that I see that there's a lot of similarities um, between the way turbulence has progressed and, and you know, the issues that we still have in that field and where we are with collective behavior. I'm um, starting off with that. The first thing I have here is that both are just extraordinarily complicated. And if you wait long enough, you can see, you know, if you watch a river moving, you can see potentially whatever you want to see. It'll happen eventually. And I feel like the same issue if you watch a bunch of animals walking around, they'll do something. Um, if you wait long enough, they'll do sort of everything that is possible for them to do. Um, so I am going to talk about collective behavior primarily because um, that's where my focus has been. So the requisite pretty pictures here. 
Um, collective behavior is, is this wonderful field that sits at the nexus of many, many different kinds of science. And you could go after thinking about this, and particularly, I, I think the question that Ilya asked earlier of what would success look like depends a lot as to uh, who you are and what kind of questions you want to ask. I'm going to focus primarily on physics because that's where I come from, but also, especially near the end, bring in a little bit of an engineering flavor. I've, I've spent my entire academic career in engineering departments, and I think looking through collective behavior or behavior in general through the engineering lens gives you an interesting way to frame that question of success, where success can mean understanding this well enough to be able to co-opt it and design it in an artificial system that suits my purposes. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind here as a potential direction to go is sort of once you understand, what can you do? My own work has focused primarily on two systems. So in the laboratory, we've been working with uh, chironomid midges. So these are mating swarms of these midges. They have the property that these swarms are, are very, very disordered in that you don't have any of this typical kind of thing you think of with collective behavior or collective motion or ordered motion. So you don't have all the midges flying in one direction. Instead, the whole, the whole uh, group sits still from a center of mass standpoint, but then every individual wiggles around in a complicated way. And then more recently, we've been doing field work on um, corvids in England. So primarily with jackdaws and also with rooks and occasionally serendipitously some other uh, kinds of corvids as well. So those are the more sort of typical ordered flocks that, that we think of when we think about uh, bird motion. Um, in the swarm context, and I'll touch on these as I go forward, we've been thinking about swarms as, as a, a prototype for act, thinking about active materials. Um, and then taking advantage of the fact that we have these in the lab so that we can do classic kinds of perturbation response experiments. We can poke at the swarms and see how they respond. In the bird cases, um, we've been thinking um, hard about what's the role of, of heterogeneity at the individual scale and how can that percolate up to the group level um, and whether you can see some kind of hierarchical uh, dynamics going on as you do in turbulence. I think all of we, everyone comes at this with their own perspective. To just give a very brief uh, thanks to the people who've been involved in all the experiments here um, at Stanford, been a bunch of people, both former and current, working on various of these projects. Um, and for the birds in particular, because that's a big field project that I have no experience in field work, um, Alex Thornton's group at uh, University of Exeter has been really uh, instrumental in making that work. And Richard Vaughn's group at Simon Fraser has been helping us with a lot of the, the visualization challenges. So, the prompt that we were all given was to say, okay, given that we can track everything, and that's debatable, but given that we can track a lot, um, what should we do with that? So I framed this around, I think Ari had five questions, I have six, so some of them are the same. Um, so I'll launch into that and illustrate these things with um, aspects of my own work, but this is not at all to say that I'm the only one working on this far, far from. So the, the first question that's been bugging me for almost since I started uh, working on collective behavior is you wanna talk about a group, right? You wanna say you have a whole bunch of animals together and they form a group and we have lots and lots of words in English for what that group should be. It would suggest that we're, we're saying that the group itself has, has identity independent of its constituents. That should mean that that group has properties and that you should be able to say this group of midges and this group of some other kind of insect and this group of birds, they're all some in some ways similar and in some ways different. So you, it, it sort of leads you to think about wanting to compare these things. And we wanna model stuff and we wanna be able to say, this is a good model and that is not a good model. So how do we really do that? Um, one way that has been done, and I'm gonna uh, show some work that I'm sure we're all familiar with from the Ian Cousins group a uh, long time ago now, um, is to benchmark these models or to compare groups based on morphology. So that you know, here I put in some behavioral rules and I get things moving more or less in a straight line that looks like a bird flock. Here I change up my rules and now they all go around in complicated ways that looks like a swarm. So this is a good flock model and this is a good swarm model because they look similar. Uh, they passed what my here at Stanford, Stephen Monosmith calls the looks pretty good test. Um, and then you go off and you build your, your uh, computer vision models and, and you put it into video games and you put it into movies and, and in a very real way you can declare success. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you know all of the details and to put up a really unfair straw man, um, all of these examples look pretty similar, but one of them costs a whole lot more than the others because its properties are very, very different. So the question is, how do you go beyond morphology or shape or, or the, a visual representation to say something more detailed and say, ah, now my model is good or these two groups are, are similar or different. 
I was really happy to hear Andre mention thermodynamics earlier because this has been a, a real focus of my work over the past few years. I'm, I'm trying to take that analogy seriously that um, in some ways we have forgotten in this field that thermo came first before statistical mechanics, a long time before statistical mechanics. And it gives you a benchmark for what your statistical mechanics ought to produce. So we've been playing around with this in a lot of contexts with swarms. We've been trying to characterize properties at the group level. Um, so we did some experiments where with a visual, um, a moving visual signal on the ground, we could take one swarm and pull it apart into two, but found that the swarm stayed displaced toward each other, suggesting the existence of some kind of inherent tensile strength. Once you make that dynamic, you can actually do the analog of shear wave spectroscopy and extract a full dynamic uh, viscoelastic modulus for swarms. Um, we did some work showing that if you, if you look at swarms in the right way, you can treat them as an inner condensed core, if you will, surrounded by a more diffuse vapor phase where those regions maintain identity even though individuals pass back and forth between them. So it really is like some kind of phase coexistence as you would see in like a liquid gas system. And, and most recently we've tried to push this you know, to its logical limit and come up with the analog of an equation of state. So define state variables and then show that that works by perturbing the swarm with a cyclic process and showing that you can drive it through the analog of something like um, uh, an engine. So a, a thermodynamic cycle where you can repeatedly go back and forth between a couple of different um, states and trace out the same path over and over in some kind of phase space. Um, the idea here would be that all of these kinds of thermodynamic properties are much more complicated to come up with than just some kind of visual appeal or some kind of uh, linear average um, that these properties are, are more subtle and harder to reproduce with the model and maybe more discriminatory between comparing different kinds of groups. So uh, um, the big question here though, is how do, you, how do you really wanna characterize what a group is? That led us to thinking about a, a sort of more fundamental question, which, which is also kind of bothersome in that how do, you, how do you wanna even know that a group is collective in the first place? Um, the example I, I tend to use is that, so, there is sort of broad agreement that the midges, the mating swarms I look at are collective behavior. But if I just put out a banana peel and wait for a while and I get fruit flies that just naturally come and fly around the banana peel, those are not supposed to be collective and that, that they're not social animals. So, but at the end of the day, I look at them and I see swarmy behavior over both. How do I know that one's collective and, and the other is not? Is that even a meaningful question? Um, Originally, people talk about order parameters for this, but that's problematic when you have disordered groups and there is no obvious order parameter. More recently, um, our colleagues in Rome uh, proposed that, that correlation is the right way to look at this. But in our lab insect swarms, the correlation lengths are essentially non-existent. Um, we see them being about an order of magnitude smaller than swarms in the wild. Um, Although we did find that when we start poking around at the swarms and in a paper that was published earlier this year, as we start poking our swarms, they develop long correlation lengths, regardless of how we poke at them. Um, so that there is a connection that I'll come back to in a minute as I try to race through this and keep us on time between the external environment and the context that the animals are living in and what the properties of that group are so that there, there is unavoidable coupling there. Um, Another question that I think is, is relevant here is to ask about the role of individual heterogeneity. Uh, birds, animals, whatever, are not atoms. And, and treating them all as identical particles may be okay in some contexts and may not be in other contexts. One particular example that I think we can all agree on might be important is the role of, of existing uh, social bonds or social structure um, that may persist within the kind of collective behavior. Um, we see that in our jackdaws because jackdaws mate for life. When they fly around in flocks, there's a flock there, but there's also these pairs that stick together within the flock. Um, in a paper that we, we published last year, we showed that uh, you can see macroscopic consequences of the fact that your flock is not just a flock of individuals, but a flock that contains some pairs and some uh, loner birds. And that the pairs you have, um, there is a, a trend in decreasing uh, the strength of the correlations in the flocks. Another example that I think is a really exciting um, direction forward in thinking about collective behavior are collective groups consisting of more than one species. So this picture right here is actually a flock that consists of both rooks and jackdaws. Um, there's starting to be more and more work um, on trying to, to understand how uh, the composition in terms of, of speciation within a collective group might affect the group properties. 
We mentioned this before about the, the role of the environment or the ecological context and how that changes the behavior. Um, and I asked Ariana earlier about how, how you wanna build this into models. I think that's very complicated. The example that we've used, so these kinds of transit flocks and jackdaws were what we originally studying, but then Alex and Gill went out and did an experiment where they put this model uh, predator, a taxidermy fox in the middle of a field and played some playback calls, some scolding calls that said to all the jackdaws around, ah, come look, something is wrong. And instead of a nice ordered transit flock, we got this mobbing flock. And in, in addition to just the morphology being different, you actually, we actually could find that they switched from exhibiting uh, topological interactions in the transit flocks to metric interactions in the mobbing flocks. So that you can see now with mobbing flocks, a really beautiful um, uh, density dependent phase transition uh, that you don't see in transit flocks. So the rules of the game now change because you've changed the context that the birds are living in, even though they're the same birds. Just very briefly, uh, two more questions to, to round this out as I'm running out of time. Um, that I've done less on that I think are, are challenges and Gordon's saying, hurry up. Um, I think it's a really important thing to start uh, connecting group behavior and, and the constraining group behavior by the way that animals actually interact with their environment, both the biomechanics of how they move and what sensory capabilities they have. And that's important from an engineering standpoint as well, because if I build a robot, the robot can only do so many things. And it'd be awesome if I could predict the behavior I get based on how, what, uh, uh, functionality I give the robot. We've done a little bit of that with midges and birds. And then the last one that I have no real idea exactly on how to do is this broader question of what are groups actually, what are animals actually trying to do? What are they trying to optimize? What are the constraints? This is a really key question for bio-inspired engineering. You see lots of engineers saying like, oh, evolution optimizes everything. So I'll just go and build a system that looks like these, these birds without necessarily an understanding of what exactly the bird's trying to optimize. Um, that to me is very, very, very difficult to do, but I think essential for applying some of this for the future. So I will leave this up, those six questions I outlined uh, very, very rapidly and take questions. Thanks, Nick. Um, we have another question for Ilya from you, uh, for you. Um, so he says, <laughs> Nick, but mean field models are in some regimes equivalent to local interaction models, mathematically, like they can't be distinguished. And a, and a banana peeled is a, is a mean field. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess I don't know Absolutely. if that's more of a comment. <laughs> Did you have any response? No, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a great question. I think it's not even obvious always that it's important to draw the distinction between a collective group and not, which, which and I guess the, the way to turn that around and say, I think one, one way you can connect this back to biology is, um, is packing non-social uh, critters together in a confined space the same as having um, critters that want to interact coming together on their own. At a, at a group level, is that distinguishable or does it not matter so much? Uh, any questions from the panel? I have a question. Uh, so Nick, I was I really like your thermodynamic uh, analogy. I was wondering what principles guide the choice of what a relevant thermodynamic variable might be in these complicated interacting systems. Uh, yeah, that's 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 one of the key ones here. What we have done so far, and I am not at all trying to say that this is the right approach or the only approach or whatever, is to go back to classical thermodynamics and say you got six, and they come in, uh, um, they come in pairs, and so let's start with the analogs of those things and see what we can get out of it. Um, that's not at all to say that they're the right ones or the only ones. You couldn't pick a different set. In fact, you know that from thermal, right? That you could pick equivalent sets of things. Um, and you can do all sorts of Lashonda transforms between them. Um, so we, we have started with a pure analogy to classical thermodynamics and, and tried to see how far that can get us. But I think there's an enormous uh, opportunity here to, to play around with that. Um, there are issues too that of course these systems are out of equilibrium. Um, so this is really, really just making an analogy. Um, hopefully a productive one, time will tell. Sorry, Alex. Uh, Alex look, oh. Yes, so I, I really like, I mean, the great talk. I really liked especially the, um, the point in the end about, well, even if we can just reproduce the behavior, that doesn't necessarily give us understanding. I mean, one idea is, for example, let's say you zip your data and you obviously that that's a great way to compress it, but that's no way a model of behavior. So how how do we kind of how do you tackle that problem? Because I think that's a fundamental problem. Really. Are you asking 
to I'm not quite sure the, I understand the question. Okay, I, I guess I'm saying, how can we actually build models to reproduce behavior that do give us insights rather than just compressed data? Yeah, so, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I don't think I know the answer to that. I think it's a really, really key question. I, I my, my bias here, given train, being trained as a physicist, is sort of the same thing I was asking Ari earlier about what are the principles that we want to found a model on? Um, do we have that kind of analog? Because you're right, otherwise it's, it's different between building a descriptive model and a sort of something that you might trust a little bit more to be predictive. I don't really know how to do that, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important challenge. Bill? I wanted to pick up this thread about, you know, as a first step, you did things analogous to classical thermodynamics, but that's not quite fair, right? Because if I want to do the thermodynamics of a magnet, I need to know that I'm supposed to vary the magnetic field and that's conjugate to the magnetization. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And, and, you know, similarly, if I want to do a liquid crystal or something like that, right? I mean, you, you know this. Um, and, and if you get this wrong, then you can you can make a mess, right? <laughs> so um, I don't know if you apply a magnetic field to an antiferromagnet, something happens, but it's not yeah. not what you were hoping for. No, um, no, absolutely. So I guess I mean obviously you 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 try something sensible to start with, and and no first try can be criticized, right? I mean, but but um, <laughs> oh, that's not true. They well, come on. Criticized. I mean, <laughs> sorry. There, there's a class of sensible first tries where it's easy to say afterwards, "Oh, why didn't you do X?" That's not fair. Mm -hmm. yep. But you're. I want I want to ask about this idea that there's a thermodynamic approach which somehow uh, allows you to. Is, is somehow simpler and allows you to evade, are you evading assumptions or is it, right? You're contrasting I, these two approaches. So for instance, I if, I say, compute, if I want to compute correlations, I have to decide which things I'm going to correlate. That's a sort absolutely. of mechanics problem. But on the other hand, if I want to do thermodynamics, I need to know what, what are the fields I'm supposed to apply. Absolutely, and, and, and it would be completely wrong to say that I'm avoiding assumptions. I'm making tons of assumptions. I think that the, what's guiding us there is trying to say, what can I say that I think is non-trivial, only considering kind of the, the macroscopic scale, the group scale, without having to dig into what exactly the individuals are doing. Um, that's the, sort of the, 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 the idea that we're trying, that we're trying to pursue here. Um, and so that's the way I'm using the word thermodynamics, sort of like ignoring, I don't know what the stuff is made of, what can I tell just about the sort of large scales of it. Um, the other, to, to get to your other question too, um, in terms of, you know, I don't know, I didn't, you know, I need to know that it's a magnet, a ferromagnet before I apply a magnetic field and know what that's conjugate to. We are constrained in this case as to what, what we know how to, how we know how to manipulate the swarms. And I, I don't know exactly what that's doing. So I know that there, so that the manipulations we've done have been um, for this experiment, uh, acoustic and uh, so with sound and with light levels. I can't tell you exactly what those do. They do something and, and the swarm moves around and it changes its parameters. But I have no idea why it should be that changing the light changes the effective pressure in the swarm. So yeah, and it, it is very much early stages, first attempt kind of thing where I'm limited by, by what I can do. And then I'm trying to see how far that takes me and, and seeing what, what happens when I do that. All right, any, any more comments or questions? All right, well, I guess uh, given that, I just really wanna thank all of our speakers and everybody that's been tuning in on YouTube and participating in the comments and everything. It's, for me, it's been a lot of fun. Hopefully it's been enlightening and fun for everybody else here. Um, thank, again, like to thank uh, my co-organizer, Greg, uh, and then, and also especially like to thank Tira Ward, who, uh, who through, the administrator here has been able to get all of the stuff up on YouTube. I hope working more or less smoothly for everybody. And this, it's been great. It's been an experience. Uh, Greg, anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, I just want to thank everyone, uh, including everyone out there. The The video will remain, right? Right, Gordon? We'll yeah. have a rec yep. the recording will remain. It, it should stay up on the Emory TMLS YouTube channel. 
Right. And, you know, we were we were overwhelmed by the, the response to, to this meeting. And certainly we'd like to build on that in the future. So all I would say is thanks to everyone, but also stay tuned for whatever comes next. Yeah. And and what I can tell you, one of the things that's next again, as I mentioned earlier, is we'll be having a workshop sometime the week of May 25th on automated inference and physical systems that, uh, so stay tuned. So as we subscribe to the Emory, EM, Emory TMOS YouTube channel uh, or fo and follow it on Twitter, those announcements will be coming out uh, shortly. So again, uh, thank I you. Every I want to thank, sorry, I forgot about, it. I wanted to thank your group members and my group members yes. who, are looking over the, who are looking over the comments channels and filtering the questions up so that we could ask them to all of you. And that's how we were able to interact with this wider audience. So thanks to my group, thanks to your group. Really appreciate your help. Thanks also to the organizers for this really exciting and interesting idea and format. <laughs> thanks, Ari. Good, I think it worked. Great, well, thank you everybody. Okay, bye, thanks everyone. It should stay up on the Emory TMLS YouTube channel. Right. And you know, we were we were overwhelmed by the, the response to, to this meeting. And certainly we'd like to build on that in the future. So all I would say is thanks to everyone, but also stay tuned for whatever comes next. Yeah, and and what I can tell you, one of the things that's next again, as I mentioned earlier, is we'll be having a workshop sometime the week of May 25th on automating inference and physical systems that I just wanted to say thank you. That was that was uh, that was great. You did, yeah, you did great. Yeah. Okay. Greg, thank you so much. That was a blast. Yeah, y'all, you guys did great. You were nervous, but you did really good. <laughs> We couldn't have done it without you. So thank you. Really appreciate it very much. All right. Well, let me know if there's um, ever anything that you need from me. Okay. You stay uh, safe and healthy. And I don't know what Georgia is like right now, but, but I hope it gets better. <laughs>